to the afternoon session of the Landmarks Preservation Commission's public hearing and public meeting of April 16th. We are uh, resuming this afternoon session with our Pre Preservation Department public hearing agenda. Uh, we'll begin with uh, public hearing item number two, and I will turn it over to Corey Harala to take us through the afternoon. Hey, thank you, Sarah. Uh, public hearing item number two is LPC 24-07061, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 310, lot 21, 404A Henry Street in the Cabo Hill Historic District. This is a row house built circa 1870, and the application is to modify fire escapes and install a rear balcony. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing via Zoom. Uh, Mr. Balbaki, you now have control of the presentation. You just need to click on your screen. Great, and then you can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Please state your name for the record and you may begin. Hi everyone, my name is Kareem Balbaki. I will be presenting a residential building uh, proposing to do a balcony at the fourth floor in the Cobble Hill Historic District. Uh, the address is 404A Henry Street. And uh, as you can see here in the second picture, we have an existing fire escape that's not in use and is going to be removed. And uh, where you could see my mouse hovering, we're going to propose a balcony at this level. This is a historic district map and an aerial view from Google Maps showing the location of the building. So it's right here, right here. Here we have some streetscapes. Uh, if you pay attention to the left one, there is an existing fire escape there that is not visible at this time. So the proposed balcony, which will be starting at the same location of the fire escape and about the same height in uh, for the railing, will still not be visible in the proposed. These other two pictures are just rear views of the building, which is in the middle and the adjacent neighbor. Here are some additional pictures. Uh, these two pictures on the left are from the opposite side on the opposite block, just to show that it's not visible from this little alleyway. And here is another picture from that same area we were talking about in the previous slide. You still can't see any portion of the actual fire escape, but you can see the ladder, which will remain existing. It won't be touched. Here are some historical photos of the front of the building, but we're not doing any changes there. Here is an existing rear elevation of the three properties from the uh, rear. So this is our building. This is the one on the left side, which is right here. And this one is on the right, which we saw a photo of before. Uh, this is the fire escape that's going, both are going to be removed, but only in this area will we be proposing a new balcony. Here are the existing dimensions of the fire escape that's going to be removed. Here is a proposed elevation. Now it's not changing in the style or look very much. We are making it shorter, but it is going to be deeper as we can see on the next slide, the dimensions will be shown. So previously it was three feet four, and now we're making it five feet and it was about nine feet or nine feet four in length and we're making it seven, seven feet four, sorry about that. And here is just a proposed close up look of it. There is another balcony that uh, we actually designed in the area. It's at 373 Henry Street, which is just a couple blocks away within the district. It's over here in this location. Now this one uses cantilevered beams instead of a little uh, angle like an actual fire escape does, but ours will match more the style of a fire escape than this one. And here is another one in the area, 337 Clinton Street. This one is a little different as they are keeping the fire escape and they're adding onto it, but it is the same idea of using the fire escape as a balcony. And that is all. So if you guys have any questions, please. Okay, thank you. And so commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay, let's see if we have any public testimony. Is there anyone in the room who would like to speak on this item? Not seeing that there is, I will turn it over to Gregory Kala to see if we have any remote participants. Thank you, Chair Carroll. 
We did not receive any signups beforehand for this item, and I do not see any hands raised right now. So I will just note for the record that Brooklyn Community Board 6 recommends approval, and I will bring it back to you, Chair Carroll. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, Commissioners, are any final questions? Okay, I think we can move to our discussion. So Commissioner Chen, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Ginsburg, would you second that second. motion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed. And so we'll begin our discussion. This is a proposal to replace a fire escape basket with a balcony that will be designed and detailed like a fire escape basket with including the angle underneath. Um, the applicant is slightly deeper and shorter in width and the applicant has shown um, approval, a similar approval that where we approved a balcony on a top floor window on a visible rear facade. This proposal is not visible from a public way. At least this portion of the facade is not visible from a public way. So we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Jefferson, would you like to start this one? Totally approved. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Goldblum, okay. Commissioner Ginsburg? Agreed. Commissioner Same Chen? Same okay. Does anyone disagree or have a different thought? I was... Okay, well, Vice Chair Bland and then Commissioner I was Lockwood. only going to say, even if it were visible, I could approve it. <laughs> okay. I think it's brilliant, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. <laughs> well, I think we have a consensus then. <laughs> oh, okay. Or I can. We have rules for fire escapes, like removing some in some cases, adding some in some cases. We don't really have a specific rule for this. So in other cases, when you've seen these, they've generally been bigger than this one. So it's something we would occasionally do, but I think to play it safe, we brought it forward. But it is something we're considering for a future rule to allow staff to approve these types of installations. Yeah. <laughs> That would be very helpful. <laughs> All right, go ahead, yeah. Commissioner. In the matter of LPC 24 07061, uh, 404 Henry Street, Cobble Hill, Historic District, uh, application to modify a fire escape and install a rear deck. I note that the bidding scale, scale of materials and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historical character of the Cobble Hill Historic District. I recommend approval find that the work will not eliminate any significant architectural features, that the work will not be visible from public thoroughfares, that the new balcony, railing, and ladder will be simple, utilitarian in design, in keeping with the existing fire escape and landing and will be called typical decks and fire escape found within the block, that the balcony will only project modestly further than the existing fire escape, and that the open quality of the installation will not overwhelm the rear facade, and that the work will not detract from the special architectural and historical character of the building or historic district. Thank you. And Commissioner Goldblum, would you second the motion? Second. All right, Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Chu? Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Master? Aye. Nine in favor, none opposed. The motion passes. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you. And we'll move to the next hearing item. Next item is public hearing item number three. LPC 23-08409, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 6691, lot 38, 74 Wellington Court in the Fisk Terrace, Midwood Park Historic District. This is a colonial revival style freestanding house with alterations designed by A. White Pierce and built circa 1905. The application is to construct a new addition and to legalize work completed without LPC permits, including the replacement of gates at the driveway and front walkway, repaving the driveway, alterations to the front entrance and steps. Uh, it was advertised as also to legalize the installation of the deck at the second floor, but my understanding is that is being uh, restored by the applicant and therefore not uh, part of what needs to be reviewed today. Okay, thank you. Hi, welcome, please go ahead. 
Hi, my name is Mo Rahi. Um, I'm sorry if I have a little voice problem. I'm a little bit under the weather. Okay. So we we had a presentation before about the same project a couple of months ago. Uh, just want to reiterate why we are back because we took your considerations as to do a, a modification into the existing building to the back. We initially had it in the front of the building. So now we took uh, your suggestions and we are only doing a one story uh, extension in the back of the building. Uh, literally there's no back of the building because this is a corner lot. So I just wanna make sure we use the right frames back and front and the side because this is a corner lot. Um, so the, uh, the property is in a Fisk uh, Midwood area and um, it's a beautiful colonial revival house um, that we are doing, uh, we are proposing an extension to. Um, so what we have on the first page is an existing historic building, and we also have the historic uh, district on the red, on the right side. Uh, just so we know the building itself is not a landmark, it's just a district. Uh, and then in the bottoms, we have some uh, pictures of the existing building, um, front entrance, uh, the si and the side, and the for this sake, I'll say the back of the building. Here we, we are showing you the neighbor's building along with our building that is seated uh, on the on the corner uh, bottom left hand. That's the building uh, on the bottom left. It's it's on uh, court. Uh, it's on Wellington Court, and the corner street is East Seventeenth Street. Um, there are two buildings on the right, and there's uh, one building in the back that um, covers the building. So the building on the top is. On the top left-hand corner, that's on East 17th Street. That's the neighbor on back of the building on this case. And the uh, the second photo is a existing building showing it's um, an illegal uh, deck that has been there before the present owners has uh, brought. So we want to also eliminate that deck in this proposal. Uh, this over here is showing the, uh, the property itself and we are requesting for some legalizations as the this new present owner wants to legalize because the uh, work were done prior to him purchasing the, uh, the, uh, the property. So some of the items that were done uh, before is, if you look at the driveway on the driveway pavement on the top right, uh, original was a concrete driveway at least that's what we have photos of. And then the, the renovation that was done was done with pavers. So that is one item we want to uh, legalize. Um, the, second I, the second item would be that the front door entrance, which again, from the pictures we found, it has white doors, but we want to do a, uh, 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 it was changed to a uh, black uh, with mullions inside, which looks like it goes appropriate with the building. Um, and then the uh, sorry, I just and then the la uh, left corner is the uh, the gate to the front entrance. It's also modified. The existing on the left is uh, like a regular uh, fence that was there, and the previous owner changed it to a little bit more, uh, uh, I would say, decorative fence. Uh, looks uh, will look nicer to go with the house. And as well as on the right side, which is the gate for the driveway, uh, it's matching gate for the driveway that has, uh, you know, also been re um, uh, uh, done as a new uh, fence. So those are the these are the three items we'd like to uh, legalize within this presentation. Uh, so these are some of the items. <clears throat> so here, what we have is a designation photo on the left top corner. Uh, showing how the building was without the uh, the deck on the right side of the photo. So that's the deck that was built uh, without a um, without a permit. Uh, pr again, all these are prior conditions to be, uh, before this uh, present owner is owning the building. And then on the left, uh, on the bottom left uh, corner photo is what is the rendering of the new proposal should look like without that deck. So we try to match exactly uh, what it is. I'll get in the extension because the left side of the building is what we are extending. So I'll get into that in the next moment. Um, 
So again, this is what the deck looks like from the deck itself. So just to show that we're gonna be removing this, the bottom left-hand corner is the sloping of the roof to show how the existing slope was really uh, sloped down so that, because my renderings may think that we are sloping down too much. That's why that photo is there, just to show that how the sloping of the roof is. Um, so this is the, the lot of the building. The, again, the building sits in a beautiful corner lot, which is uh, in Wellington Court and uh, East 17 Street. Um, the red is our existing uh, building on the right side. And then the blue is what we are proposing as the extension. And the left, obviously, is the existing uh, condition of the site. Uh, this is just uh, showing that we're not changing anything. But we just wanted to have it there just so that you can see that we changed. We reversed it back to the original plan from our last meeting. Okay, so this is where we're getting into the extension, which would be uh, the back side. Again, no back side, but for this instance, we just want to reiterate the front of the building versus the back of the building. That's why I'm using the back side. Um, so this is the extension that we are proposing on the back, which is a one story. Uh, what we try to do our best is uh, have some architectural features of the existing building come to the new extension in the back. So what we did, we took the bay area, and we took it out into the new bay on the, uh, on the brick, if you can see it. Um, so we try to, um, try to mimic the existing roofing so that there is, uh, you know, the, you can see the railing, but you can also see some of the roofing come uh, down to give that, um, you know, uh, the, the revival of a, a colonial look so that it doesn't look like a flat roof. Um, because we are proposing a flat roof with a deck. Um, so this is what the existing, so what else we try to do is, uh, we try to keep the existing building as intact as possible without uh, you know, touching it anymore like we did last time. So what we did is we're keeping the same windows we are, where those bay windows are, are in the back, we're just moving them in the front. So we're not, re we're not putting any new windows, it's just the same windows just coming into the new back extension. Uh, on the left is the existing photo you can see. So we try to, uh, uh, you know, try to the elevation. Uh, when you're doing rendering, we can get a better photo with, with the with the surrounding buildings. We cannot get to a good uh, straight photo because of the surrounding conditions. Uh, this side is showing the other side uh, on the East 17th Street side how it looks from East 17th Street. Uh, again, on the left side is the designated photo, and on the right side is showing with, with the blue, market is, uh, blue marking is. Uh, that is what our extension uh, is proposed to be. Um, again, we, we, so what we did on this side is that, I, I'm not sure if you can tell on the rendering, we did a little um, offset from the existing building by one feet so that we can show you that the existing, uh, the new proposed, is um, in addition to the new without touching the existing feature of the ar uh, existing architectural feature of the building. That's what we are trying to um, establish over here as much as we can. Um, here is showing the other side uh, of the uh, building, showing the extension, how it looks from the other side. Um, again, uh, we're not touching the existing building, it's just how that new extension looks on the side. You can see it uh, uh, on the uh, right side is the rendering, on the left side is the existing building. So you can see how, uh, you know, that we have not touched the, uh, much of the existing building itself. Um, so the, the size of the uh, extension is almost, it's like uh, 17 by uh, 50 feet long. So we're getting like about uh, 200, uh, 50 square feet, if I do the math, I think. Um, so this is the proposed seller plan, plan, the existing seller and the new proposed. As you can see, we are, uh, obviously we'll have to do a foundation. This is why it's there showing the seller. Uh, so we're gonna have a seller into the building. And then you can see the first floor, uh, proposed existing versus the proposed new, which now we are in the backside. We, the only thing changing 
on the first on the um, existing building is really nothing. We just opening a door uh, into one of the windows to to access both uh, spaces. Uh, this is the second floor, which no change on the second floor except just the deck that is getting built on the uh, on the new extension. This is the attic, no change in the uh, in the attic. Uh, this is the roof plan to show you that we're not touching the existing roof anymore, uh, so that the roof uh, will be intact. Uh, these are just some uh, sections of the building showing how this is, and this is the rendering that shows that we are not touching any of the roof, and we did the best possible rendering to show you that the existing staying the same. And you can see on the right side, which is the uh, uh, the site plan showing the way the extension is and where the existing building is. Um, and this is the end of the presentation. Do you guys have any questions or concerns? Great, thank you very much. Any questions, commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Jefferson. I would have one question. On the front facade, um, the new steps, you know, there are two pillars, and then you put in the new steps. Is the brick the same? as the pillars, because if you look at the the original, the steps were darker than the pillars, or is it just a, a rendering issue? You, so we're not, we're not doing any yeah. renovations in the front anymore. This is just to legalize what is there. Right, right, right. So, the, so my question is, the, the composition of the brick on the right-hand side, that's the way it is now, correct? Correct. So the pillars and the stairs are the same material. Yes, right? correct, correct. Is, there's no change, correct. Okay. The you. only change you're going to see is that stone that they put in there just to give it a, a little, uh, uh, you know, uh, characteristic just from a regular step to just the stone that they put in there. Yeah. On the left-hand side, the stairs were darker, right? Or, or is that just a rendering? Or, yeah, sure. Um, it, it, it's just the way the picture was taken at what time of the day. That's what it was. Because one is taken in the summertime, one is like in fall, winter time, so it was a little bit darker. That's, that's, that's just the way the picture is taken. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Chu. Could you go to slide 14? 14? I have a question about your plan. So on the image on the right, that's a roof plan. Wait, can you go one more? Sorry. Yeah, there. The existing house and then the addition in gray. The the addition is set back one foot. Is that what that is? On, on the seventeenth street side, yes, one foot. And therefore you you only have a little bit of roof eave to stretch in front of your addition to continue that pitch, yes. right? I'm just wondering what determined that foot. And if I look at the rest of the house, if you look at the right side of the image, the the um, the rear, I think that's the rear, has inset of of a dimension to to articulate the volume of the smaller volume behind. And it's the same on both sides. Would you ever consider just using that as a typical dimension? It strikes me that the foot seems so little and what determines a foot? Okay. Yeah. We initially had it straight flush, so right. we we wanted to give it a little bit of a depth by by give, giving more. The the owners will be losing a lot more square footage. We don't have that much square footage to play with. Being that, uh, we wanted to be uh, still staying away from the neighbors as much as we can without projecting more onto that side. So because we we are we have a tight limitation into the space in terms of how much we want to go back, that will, um, uh, because again, it's going to be owner occupied on that first floor. We're trying to get him a bedroom as big as possible without, uh, get, again, we, without going into the, because last time we had issues with the neighbors saying, oh, you guys are making too much uh, extensions. So th we, we wanted to go back a little bit on the back side. If I go, go to the, um, I'm going to go to the site plan so you can see what I'm talking about. So that site plan here, uh, that's the blue is my extension. So mm -hmm. we are um, 
We're like almost seven, I, I believe we are almost 17 feet away from the neighbor's side. So we, it, it, and, and, and what happens is because we have a garage that is on the, the right side of the, in the right corner, on the top right corner, that's the garage. So if I were to extend this more over, um, symmetri uh, symmetrically, I'm gonna lose the balance how the building is gonna look. So this is why I haven't gone that side on the right. And we, 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 tr we try to get that one feet just to give a uh, differential between the existing and the new. I like what you said about that. I think that that was a very good comment that you said that everything you did in the addition was to distinguish it from the existing so that you set it back. I think that was all good. I'm just questioning how much you did it, that's all. I, I, again, it's just because of the square footage. I, I think you answered the question, okay. thank you. Okay, other questions? All right, um, let's see if we have any public testimony. We may have more questions after that. And I will note that there is no one in the room to speak on this item, so I will turn it over to Gregory Kala to see if we have any remote participants. Thank you, Chair Carroll. We have one remote participant with their hand raised, that being Lucy Levine from the Historic Districts Council. Lucy Levine, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. Please unmute your line and state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hi, Commissioners. My name is Lucy Levine. I'm speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HDC feels this proposal could be appropriate, but the presentation is not fully developed, so it's hard to make any judgment. We feel the applicant should work with staff to further refine the details of this addition to be more in keeping with the district. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I do not see any further hands raised in, in the attendees list. So I will note for the record that Brooklyn Community Board 14 does not weigh in on individual applications unless they are requested to do so. They did not receive such a request for 17, 74 Wellington Court and thus do not have a resolution on this application. And with that, I'll bring it back to you, Chair Carroll. All right, thank you. Um, so would you like to ad address the comments or I guess the comments about the level of detailing on the addition and how it relates to the building? Okay, so I'm not sure about the level of uh, detailing. I, I, I think we did a pretty good job in terms of showing how the extension is happening in, in, in lieu of the relationship of the neighbor's buildings and how it goes in this district. Uh, the, that's why we only with, went with the one-story building and not, a, not the full height of the building, so just so that we're not architecturally um, uh, um, damaging the existing profile. So this is why we did what we did as a one-story extension within itself and try to uh, mimic the existing building features to make it look like it belongs to the part of the building. All right, thanks. Commissioners, any final questions? All right, we'll move to our discussion. Commissioner Master, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? So second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the hearing is closed. So commissioners, you may recall, we saw this an application for this uh, property not that long ago, and um, the applicant is trying to accommodate his family, and because of the sighting on the corner, believed that the only addition that would be compliant with zoning would be to go forward into the front yard. And so they proposed essentially extruding the building out and recreating the front facade. Um, and I think at that time, Commissioner Goldblum, you and, and I think Commissioner Ginsburg thought that there would be a way um, around that because it is a corner a lot and to go back and talk to the Department of Buildings. And so they have, and thank you for that suggestion. So they are able to now accommodate their addition on the, the uh, back side of the house, which I think is the east side of the house or the south side, <laughs> the side that is um, facing the neighbors. And um, and sort of also on the side where the garage is, and they're proposing it as one story, uh, matching the the brick uh, and the window fenestration and the bay window that's on the existing facade, and just bringing it out, carrying the roof around, and doing the deck on top. And in addition to that, we need to look at some work that was undertaken by a previous owner, which includes the pavers in the driveway, 
the black multi-light doors at the entry and the two gates um, at the driveway and at the pathway up to the house. So we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Goldblum, would you like to start this? Sure. Uh, the, I think the proposals to make corrections related to uh, legalization are, are totally appropriate. Um, I think that from a, a general approach perspective, this is a huge win for this house, for this, for this property. Uh, it's, it's generally a much more appropriate location and scale for the addition. Um, I think that, uh, generally speaking, they've, they've done, I think, a pretty good job. Um, but I do think that, that the HDC's comments are probably well, well taken. I think that in a job like this, the staff should look with the applicant at at details like the soffit and the trim and the window surrounds and the brick, you know, the sills, things like that, that are going to make it. In a way, it's funny. They're, they're, instead of xeroxing the front and extending it out, they're xeroxing the back and extending it out. Now, that's not necessarily the best way to go, but it, it you know it's okay. I do have a little concern about the Nansardy skirt on the back, which kind of has a little bit of a Burger King quality to it. Um, it does work on the street facade, I think. Um, and you do see this kind of thing um, where you have these little fake mansards going around, you know, on a balcony. Uh, I think we saw one in Douglaston done by, for Handel, the architect for his own house, mm -hmm. had a similar thing. But that's where the detail is gonna come in. And they, you know, work with staff to kind of make that not look like a fast food restaurant. Um, the other thing that might they might consider is making it a, a maybe at the back half beyond the bay window a solid balcony instead of a open rail. One of the distinctive features of this house is that the shingles kind of flare very dramatically at the base of the second floor. That might be a way to kind of uh, carry that out and, and carry that forward. Um, I also think that. Stephen's comments about the setback are, are very appropriate, and I'm sensitive to the client's needs for a sizable bedroom, but it should be noted that the room that would be affected by Stephen's comment is a walk-in closet, so uh, a walk-in closet with a very nice window. Um, so I think that I think that such an accommodation would be doable, and I think that the applicant could add another bay window or some other accretion there that would uh, make up for the loss of uh, closet space. Okay, so set that set south facade back a little bit further. Okay, all right, Commissioner Ginsburg. I agree it's a big improvement. I think uh, the applicant can work with staff on the issues that Commissioner Goldblum flagged to resolve things and that we can approve it with that. Okay, Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I, I'm in agreement, I, I think. Um, uh, uh, with Michael Goldblum's comment about HDC's uh, suggestion um, and also uh, Commissioner Chu's uh, observation about that whether that one foot is adequate. Uh, I, I, in terms of the uh, legalization, I think the pavers and the rest of the gate uh, goes off. Okay, Vice Chair Blair. I could approve it as is, but I certainly wouldn't um, deny it if it's going to be uh, set back a little bit more. Okay. Commissioner Letby. Yeah, I'm in agreement. I I think a lot of the comments are appropriate, really. This will end up, things will be changing a little bit as the applicant works with staff. And I, I just want to thank the staff for going back. And not the staff, the applicant for going back and, you know, really rethinking this and coming to us, you know, putting your best foot forward. We always appreciate that. Commissioner Chu. Yeah, I think that overall that the addition is a, gr a great improvement and that in terms of massing, you've done a pretty good job of, of minimizing its impact to the existing structure. And I will echo Michael's comment about working with staff on the details and in terms of that one volume on the east side, I would say another foot would probably do it. And I just wanted to make the point that it's not just the volume in terms of it 
not feeling like you just stretch the existing ground floor over, but you might look at that window and, and, and compose it so it doesn't look like it's a part of that middle piece. It may be compose it in a way, and if it is a closet, I think you've got some freedom in, in placement of the window. Um, but that, pay attention to the detail of the roof because if you, all your renderings, you really indicate that that's in some ways a unifying architectural element here that, that recalls the details of the existing house. And if that gets set to nothing, it's not gonna feel like these renderings feel. It's gonna look like just a bit of box inside of the house. All right, mm -hmm. Commissioner Master. Yes, I agree with Commissioner Goldblum and Commissioner Chu's comments. Um, I encourage the applicant to work with staff um, refining the details. All right, Commissioner Jefferson. In terms of the legalized work, I think the, uh, the gate that they have there now is much better than the condition to actually update that. I think the front steps, uh, the front entrance and steps are much more beautiful now. I can approve that, and I think I can approve the um, the driveway also. In terms of the new addition, I think it's beautiful the the proportion is fine. I think I prefer the the yeah, the wood railing rather than the facade deck in the back. Okay. It, it completely works out. The details should be explored. Okay. All right, so I think we can make a motion today to approve it with the condition that they continue to work carefully with the staff on all of the details and uh, that they set it back an additional foot from the on the east side. Regarding 74 Wellington Court, Fisk Terrace, Midwood Park Historic District, uh, the application is to construct an addition and legalize work completed without LPC permits, including the replacement of the gates at the driveway and front walkway, repaving the driveway, alterations to the front entrance, and rebuilding the steps and an installation of a deck on the second floor. I note that the building's style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the architectural and historic character of the Fisk Terrace and Midwood Park Historic District. With regards to the proposed addition, I recommend approval with modifications, finding that the proposed one-story addition will only be visible from the east. Along East 17th Street and will not be seen in the context of the longest primary south facade where the main entrance is located on this corner building, that the proposed addition will be set back from the east facade and will not run along the entire length of the rear facade, thereby making it subservient to the main house, that the design and materials of the addition including a projecting window bay, brick cladding, multi-light windows, wood railings, and architectural asphalt shingles will be harmonious with the materials and design of, and of the main portion of the house. And that the removal of the elevated deck from the sloped roof of the second story, which was installed without permits on the east facade, will eliminate a feature that detracts from the house. Uh, with regard to the work proposed to be legalized, I recommend approval finding that the new ornamental metal gates at the driveway and front walkway will, are harmonious with the existing fence to remain in terms of material design and finish, that the multi-light black finished metal door assembly at the entry relates well to the multi-light case and windows of the first floor, and that the brick and blue stone replacement steps harmonize with the materials and details of the base of the building and the stone pavers at the driveway harmonize with the materials of the house and paving materials at other driveways within the streetscape in terms of simple pattern and neutral tone. However, the app, I recommend that the applicant work with staff uh, to review the details uh, of the constru proposed construction and that they set the uh, addition back an additional foot along East 17th Street. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Ginsburg, would you second that motion? Second. Mark. Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Chu? Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Ludpe. Aye. Commissioner Master. Aye. With nine in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. All right, so that's approved. Thank you very much. And just continue to work with the staff. Okay, thanks, Winnie. Now move to the next item. It's public hearing item number four, LPC 24-07753. This is an application for a binding report in the Borough of Queens, Block 898, Lot 1. 2402 19th Street, the Astoria Park Pool and Play Center Individual Landmark. This is an art modern style pool complex designed by John Matthews Hatton 
Amar Embry, the second, landscape architects Gilmar D. Clark and Alan R. Jennings, and civil engineers W. Earl Andrews and William H. Latham, and built in 1934 to 36. The application is to permanently maintain a temporary masonry opening and install new doors. Hi. Good afternoon, Commissioner Sybil Young, Parks and Historic Preservation Officer. I'm here today to present a proposal to install um, doors at the rear facade of the filtration building at Astoria Pool. Um, you've seen parks come before the commission a number of times in, in recent years as we continue to improve and adapt these uh, WPA era pools in order to bring them up to health and building codes and to better serve the communities. Um, Astoria is currently um, under construction to have its 1930s filtration system replaced. Um, it's wrapping up construction now, and that was approved under another application with LPC. Here is the location of Astoria Pool along the East River at the um, at the east side is the bathhouse, uh, which is the main entrance to the facility uh, where the locker rooms are and where everyone enters the pool. And then here on the west side is the filtration building. You can also see to the north here was the recently um, adapted waiting pool, a project that came before the commission to turn the waiting pool into a playground and spray shower area, recently completed and quite a successful project. Sorry. It's, it's been lagging today oh, a little bit. It's not just you. <laughs> Nice it is a nice view. Yeah. Let's go to the Olympic trials for her in 1960. Sybil, would you like me to advance the slides for you? Uh, sure, that's fine. Yep. Okay, so here is that um, west facade of the filtration building the as it exists currently, uh, and then the area where we are proposing to install the doors. Next slide. And the proposed condition with um, eight by eight uh, steel doors. Next slide. Um, here in plan, you can see the filter building to the west here. Mm -hmm. And then that shore boulevard that runs along the East River is a pedestrian and bicycle path. And it's from that location um, where you can see these doors from the public way. Next slide. Um, just a location plan showing from where we took the photos. Next slide. So here is an existing uh, photo of the area now and then a proposed rendering. This is taken from just within the grassy area off that pedestrian path. Next slide. Um, then stepped back a bit so that you're on the pedestrian path. As you can see, um, there's a fair amount of trees and shrubs that obscure this uh, facade of the facility. Next slide. Um, so a little background on the reason these doors are needed. Uh, during construction, we were not able to get the equipment um, for the new filtration system into the building without taking down this wall just due to the size of some of these components. Um, and it became clear during construction that we really needed to keep this opening when the project was over both because should an, a piece of this equipment need to be replaced in the future, we would again have to take down the wall, which as you can imagine, if that happens during pool season or pre-pool season when we're under tremendous pressure to keep these facilities open, it would have um, great operational impacts. Also, um, as you'll see in some of the upcoming photos, a lot of the equipment is very tall and some of it's ceiling mounted. And so for our staff, to be able to safely access and maintain this equipment, we want the ability to bring a lift into the facility. Next slide. Um, just showing how it is being currently used to bring equipment in. We have a ramp in there. Next slide. 
and then the existing temporary opening and the proposed. Um, we did apply for a temporary permit for the opening, the LPP. Next slide. A detail on the door, which will be slightly recessed from the facade. Next slide. Um, these are just some images of the doors that exist on the facility. They're all standard black teal doors. Next slide. Next slide. Um, this was a door that was recently installed at the public restroom building just to the north of the pool, which is also part of the landmark site. Next slide. Um, the location for the doors was really driven by the constraints on the interior. Um, as you saw from some of those photos, there are double doors on this filter building. However, when you enter those, you are met by stairs and various pinch points, which would not allow for a lift or equipment of this size to be brought through. Then that area in pink is a large concrete filter tank that's original to the structure that runs the length of the west wall. So really the location here um, at the south on the facade was our only option for these doors. Next slide. Um, these are the interior conditions. Next slide. And some of that equipment that's recently been installed. Next slide. And next slide. It's the specifications for our door. Again, just a black standard steel door. Next slide. Um, and that is the end. Um, just an elevation show of the door again. I'm also joined by some of our engineering team should you have full filtration questions. <laughs> Thank you. Any, yes, Commissioner Chu. So this side of the, uh, the facility is on the walkway, but it doesn't really have an entry. From your no, there's yeah. the entry is from uh, the other the, side. The complete other side yeah. of the facility. Correct? And it, it does seem to be there are some paths, but they avoid this portion. Right. Um, there's no the pathways path. within that exactly. grassy area. It's really set back on that um, pedestrian path. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? All right. Let's uh, move to public testimony. And I'll note there is no one in the room to speak on this item. So I'll turn it to Gregory to see if we have any remote participants. Thank you, Chair Carroll. I do not see any hands raised currently in our attendees list. So I will note for the record that Queens Community Board 1 recommends approval. And with that, I'll bring it back to you, Chair Carroll. Okay. Commissioners, any final questions on this one? No. Okay. So let's go ahead and move to our discussion. Commissioner Jefferson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? Yeah. So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Master, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, hearing is closed. And um, so this is a, um, a door opening that the Parks Department got a permit for, a temporary permit for, uh, for the duration of the construction work and or the installation of the equipment. And so it was a construction related temporary permit. Um, and now understanding the need for this um, opening to be able to replace equipment and move lift in and out. They're seeking to um, seeking a permit approval for it permanently. Um, it is the back of the building as you as uh, those of you who know when you approach the pool, you're really approaching it from the other side and this is the really literally infrastructure of buildings. This is the filter house at the back um, that does um, have some visibility from the path, but not really uh, pathways or other access. So it, it really is more of um, the utilitarian back and um, and they're matching doors found elsewhere on the facility. So um, Commissioner Lutfi, would you like to start? Yeah. Um, Okay. Commissioner Chu? Appropriate. All right. Commissioner Master? Same. Appropriate. Commissioner Jefferson? Appropriate. Everybody agree? Anybody yep. have a different thought or a comment? Okay. So I think we can go ahead and move.
to approve that. Would you make the motion, Commissioner Lutfi? Okay. In the matter of docket 24-07753, uh, 24-0219th Street, Astoria Park, Pool and Play Center, Individual Landmark, and Art Modern Style Pool Complex Design by John Matthews Hatton, Amar Embury II, Landscape Architects Gilmore D. Clark and Alan R. Jennings and Civil Engineers W. Earl Andrews and William H. Latham, built in 1934 to 36. The application is to permanently maintain a temporary masonry opening and install new doors. I recommend that the commission issue a positive report finding that the proposed door installation is necessary to allow access for lifts and large equipment for repair and replacement of existing equipment when needed without damaging or eliminating any significant historic or architectural features that the opening is centered between the piers and installed at plain masonry at the rear of the complex, giving it a harmonious secondary presence and that the doors will be well scaled to the facade and consistent with utilitarian doors throughout this portion of the complex in terms of material finish and details. Great, thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Bland, would you second that motion? Sure. Clark. Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Mr. Chen? Aye. Mr. Chu? Aye. Mr. Ginsburg. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Commissioner Master. Aye. Nine in favor, none opposed. The motion passes. That's approved. Thank you. And we'll move to the next item. Next item is public hearing item number five, LPC 24-06499. The application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1287, lot 71, 647 Fifth Avenue, the George W. Vanderbilt Residence Individual Landmark. This is a French Beaux-Arts style townhouse designed by Hunt and Hunt and built in 1902 to 05. The application is to install signage awnings uh, and light fixtures. I believe the uh, accent lighting fixtures were uh, deemed to be approval at staff level, staff level. So we'll just be reviewing the signs and awnings. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, first slide, please. And if you could just start by stating your name, that would be great. Hi there. So um, thank you for your time, commissioners. Um, I'm happy to present this project. I'm James Botha. I'm the architect of record for the retail renovation that's happening here at 647 Fifth Avenue. All right. So the building that we have here uh, was built by George W. Vanderbilt in 1905. Um, it's one of the last remaining uh, Beaux-Arts residential mansions that was typical of this block uh, at the time. <clears throat> and uh, it originally had a twin that was right next door, as you can see in this uh, photo from 1905. And that twin was demolished in around 1940, I think. And um, so now it's all that's left is this half of the building. Um, what's just off screen there is the other residential mansion that's still left standing, uh, the Cartier building. And um, this was only lived in as a residence for about the first 10 years of his life, and then it went commercial. Uh, its first commercial tenant was a uh, art dealer. <clears throat> um, as you can see in this picture, and you'll, what you'll notice in the next pictures is uh, a fourth and fifth floor was added uh, to the building uh, in a later period in 1917. And from about that period onwards uh, is about the look that it's maintained uh, ever since then. There was some work that was done after that in the 30s, but that work has now been rest restored about 25 years ago by Versace, the last tenant who had a 20-year lease on the building. So now that lease is over, and so um, my client, Skims, is moving in. They're signing a 10-year lease, and they're only proposing to do 
minor uh, work the facade, um, really just changing lighting and, um, and signage. Trying to uh, advance the slide. Oh, <clears throat> thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this is just to give you some context. Uh, other landmark properties in the area, most notably the next door uh, Cartier building. Context for the city block. As you can see, all the other structures are a lot more modern. And the Cartier and 647 really stand out as the historic buildings of this area. <clears throat> and here's some more historic context. The image on the left is the original photograph from when it was first completed. The image on the right, uh, you can see, first of all, that the extension was made that wasn't done to the twin building. And um, you can also see that the ground floor was changed at the time to make it more commercial, I suppose, with a, a sort of a big plate glass window in the center. This uh, was rectified by uh, Versace um, in the late 90s. Here's some more uh, historic context of other landmarked uh, buildings in the area, uh, which we studied uh, when coming to decisions we wanted to make on the design and making sure it was appropriate to the neighborhood. Um, here's the building as it looked when uh, we first surveyed the building last fall. Um, this is how it is today, although the awnings have changed. Uh, there's a temp tenant that changed the awnings. Uh, I think they're red uh, at the moment. Um, but as you can see, uh, Versace, as part of their improvements, uh, restored the ground floor. And they restored not just the arched windows, but they also restored the uh, marble balustrade, the uh, sort of Juliet balcony that at that time was a wrought iron uh, fence that was done later. <clears throat> uh, here's some detail shots of looking at the awnings, of which we're proposing to replace the canvas fabric portion of the awnings and leaving everything else uh, intact. Um, bottom pictures are more showing some, some lighting and how we're not doing any more damage to the building because there's already uh, existing power um, for existing lighting. We're not actually adding any lighting. We're just doing a swap like for like uh, with a more slim line uh, lighting that's you know less noticeable and more modern. Um, here is what the Versace building looked like. This is just to give you some context of what was there um, before they closed a couple, uh, maybe a year ago. Um, you can see here they had in the left image um, all the awnings, um, which we're not, again, we're not changing those awnings. We're just switching out the fabric. <clears throat> they also had their logo on the front panel of each of those awnings all the way up to the fifth floor. Um, at that uh, second floor Juliet balcony, they had two flags. Um, from what I understand is these flags would get changed um, every once in a while, depending on if they were promoting a certain season or, or um, holiday. Um, what my client's proposing to do is just have a, a branded uh, logo on those, on those awnings with their, with their brand color. <clears throat> Uh, the image on the right shows really the ground floor experience as the pedestrians walk by. Um, there were uh, the logo, the main primary logo was um, silicone to the glass, dimensional non-lit letters um, in the center arch. And uh, flanking that were two plaques. And then in the left and right windows were um, vinyl letters down at sort of knee height. <clears throat> so here's the first rendering. I'll show you our proposed design. Um, overall context here is to show you that um, it looks much the same as the original building. Um, 
Again, we're keep maintaining the original flagpoles on the second floor and just changing out the flags themselves. And we're keeping all the original uh, awning structure on the five floors and proposing to do new awnings with a new fabric color and the tenancy logo on the front face of the awnings as we're sat through that. Um, not seen really in great detail, which I'll show you in further slides. On the Between the second and third floor, in one of the marble plaques, uh, there was a Versace uh, dimensional pin letter uh, there that we're proposing to <clears throat> take those same sort of pin holes and put in the, uh, the Skims logo there as well, non-lit, to match the surrounding marble facade. A bit more of a subtle subtler uh, logo as Versace has. <clears throat> uh, and this is just a night view, just to show you that you know, there are there is going to be <coughs> uh, up lighting, uh, lighting the building, coming from uh, slimline LED lights on the second floor balustrade, as well as the uh, fourth floor uh, pediment, and finally the uh, sixth floor balustrade. Ground floor, Signage. Um, so the only thing really different from what Versace had is we're proposing to have two logos uh, flanking the display show windows rather than over the main entrance. These will be dimensional letters, about two inch protrusion from the glass and um, silicone to the face of the glass. Below those, at the knee height level, will also be, like Versace had, a vinyl version of the logo on the face of the glass. And then flanking the door, we're putting back um, two new plaques, this time to more closely match the marble facade rather than the stainless steel plaques that were there earlier. Right now, there's just some aluminum plates that are sort of covering up uh, where the holes were for the mounting. Uh, the rest of it we're maintaining, um, not changing anything to do with any of the uh, existing doors or existing uh, metal work of these uh, windows. They're all going to be staying the same. <clears throat> this is a close up between the second and third floor, so you can get a better view of what we're proposing to do with that uh, small, more subtle logo that's a, just a dimensional letter meant to match the marble. Uh, using the same uh, pinholes as uh, Versace had. Um, it also gives you a better view of the awning proposal. Uh, this is a color, a Pantone color, that's part of the brand colors of the, um, the tenant. Um, sort of a rosy tan. Um, and then um, sort of a softer, darker color for the, uh, the Skims logo. Here's some more close-ups of the other signage, the dimensional letter on the left, which is above in those arched uh, windows. The vinyl letters in the middle, they're actually meant to give you the impression that they're three-dimensional, even though they're not. And then the uh, marble plaque with an embossed logo on the right. And here's a better version of those flags. Um, I can't remember the dimensions of the flags, but I think they're on the last slide in the appendix, um, which is the actual chop drawings from the sign uh, manufacturer. Okay, thank you. thank you. Commissioners, any questions on this? Okay, let's see if we have any public testimony. Uh, I note that there's no one in the hearing room to speak on this item, so I will turn it over to Gregory and see if we have any remote participants. Thank you, Chair Carroll. I do not see any remote participants with their hands raised. So I will note for the record that Manhattan Community Board 5 recommends denial unless the applicant submits a new design to LPC that reduces the quantity of signage and selects a more contextual color for the awnings. And with that, I'll bring it back to you, Chair Carroll. Okay, uh, so would you like to respond to the Community Board's testimony? Absolutely, thank you. Yes, I presented to the community board and I remember their, their comments. 
Uh, one of their major comments that isn't really written in there is the shape of the awnings. Uh, the awnings were originally had a, a unique shape and it would have required a new structure to the awnings as well. Um, at the meeting, that was the main point of contention. So we changed it to keep the original structure to the awnings the way they are. There was talk of them wondering if the color was historically accurate or if it would feel like it's in the right place in context to the darker red Cartier um, awnings next door and the marble color of the building. Um, so sort of a subjective opinion. Um, I believe that this is the, the color of the tenant. So it would make sense if we went with the color of the tenant. And it's not that far off from what Versace had earlier, which was also sort of a light tan color. So hopefully that can be considered as well. And then the amount of signage, um, again, we, we're submitting it. We know we're, we're going over what can be approved at the staff level, which is why we'd like to have this hearing to see if we're in agreement on if we can get approved. Okay. Outside. And so just to be clear, the, you're recladding the existing awning frames. You're hanging new banners from existing flagpoles. You are swapping out plaques, flanking the entrance with new plaques. You are uh, doing dimensional letters in the two flanking openings in lieu of the single one that Versace had over the entrance. And then the embossed plaque on the spandrel is uh, also, is that uh, new or did Versace have some? The Versace one has been taken down, but the damage is that you can actually see holes in the. In okay, the so they had one so there. And even if we re don't replace the sign, we'll have to repair that, that section. Okay. And were all of the Versace signs approved by the commission? in the past? Yes. Okay. So the combination of signs and awnings that you're proposing are very similar to what the commission previously approved for Versace in terms of number and size, um, except that you have two sets of dimensional letters on the transoms instead of one, right? Yes. Okay. Got it. Okay. Any other final questions? Yes, Commissioner Chen. So in terms of what Chair Carroll just mentioned, uh, did you ever consider placing it at where Versace had it? Just in the, the same one? Yeah. I don't believe that was, at one point it were actually all over all three arches. <laughs> so we actually, <laughs> um, it wasn't a decision made by the architect myself. It was a decision made by the client that they would rather have it over the show windows where the display of the product is rather over the entrance. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other final questions? All right. Yeah. Yes, Commissioner Chu. Um, so the, the yes, if you look at the appendix, which is in a part of this presentation deck, you, I included the shop drawings from the sign vendor. They are pin mounted pin letters. Stone. They're stone on pins. Here it is. Here's the detail. <laughs> and are they reusing the holes from the previous sign? Okay. Yes. Yes, Commissioner Lutfi. It's hard to tell from the renderings, but what are the sizes of the of these graphics? Like on you know on the awnings, on the windows, on the the banners, I mean, I, I can't help but look to the left and see just how, um, let's say, uh, how sort of small and reserved the company is. <laughs> um, right. Um, I'm not sure. Um, the primary signs are 12 inches tall on um, the two arch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can, am I able to control? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> primary meaning in the arches on yeah. the glass, right? Yeah, and then the plaques. Oh no, I'm sorry. They're ten inches. They're ten. Twelve inches was that one way up at the top that we're replacing. Uh huh. Inches, so that's twelve inches. Then ten inch high letters. Uh, over each glass arch. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the plaque is the same size as the plaque is today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then the little vinyl letters are 
four inches. Mm -hmm. I, on the banners? Oh, and then the banner, uh, the sign yeah, um, on five inches on the front face of the mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And then the banner is 636. Uh, the total size of the, the of the banner and more and the font eight or nine okay thank you all right any other questions all right let's uh, close the hearing commissioner jefferson would you make a motion to close the hearing thank you commissioner goldblum would you second that motion second. all in favor say aye, aye. 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 Um, any opposed okay the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion and so this is like other um, former townhouses on Fifth Avenue, a building that has um, been converted for commercial use and actually that involved extending it at the top and has had different commercial uses most recently, Versace and um, the proposal uh, is to basically swap out previously commission approved signs and awnings that um, ex that that are were for Versace, and that includes recladding the awning, um, hanging new banners, replacing plaques with new plaques that are of stone material, and uh, vinyl letters, and then the dimensional letters and the transoms. Um, so we'll begin our discussion. Vice Chair Bland, would you like to start this one? I think this is a pretty easy one. <laughs> um, it's all so similar to what was before. Um, and it seems to honor the, the the half of the of the original building that still remains, and um, I think it's perfectly appropriate. It'll no offense, it'll probably change again over time. And, yeah. Uh, uh, but I think I think this is quite appropriate for its place on uh, Fifth Avenue. Yeah, and I do think that the plaques will reuse holes, which would be good, and. Yeah. The other work is all reversible. Commissioner Chen? Yeah, likewise, yeah. Commissioner Ginsburg? Agreed. Commissioner Goldblum? Uh, I agree also. My only concern is the, is the big flags in the front, uh, which were previously not used as as signage. They were used as kind of flagpoles for country flags. And that is kind of consistent with what Cartier does next door, which kind of makes it uh, contiguous and nice. Uh, I mean, I think the flags might be a little overkill as product advertising. So, I mean, I think the applicant said that Versace changed them out depending on what season it was. But Mark, do we want to speak about content of banners? Yeah, we generally not uh, opine much about content of banners. It's really it goes to the cumulative impact. That's really where, how we look at it. Right. I mean, I'm the only, my only I, I'm aware of that rule. The only reason I brought it up was that it seemed like it was kind of crossing a barrier between something that's not advertising and something that is advertising. All right, Commissioner Jefferson. Um, I think it's all appropriate. The only question I have, is the lighting new, a new design? The, the lighting, they are reusing existing, they use the existing lights, but they're... It, well, they're putting new lights into, new light into the, the existing. existing wiring. Thank okay. you. <laughs> okay. um, and that is eligible for a staff level approval. Okay. It meets our rules. Yeah. Okay. All right, Commissioner Master. I think it's appropriate. All right, Commissioner Chu. Yes, I think that as it really hasn't changed the approach from the previous condition, and in fact, the plaques are maybe less visible than they were before. I think it's appropriate. Okay. Commissioner Buckby. Appropriate. Okay, so I think we have a consensus here. Vice Chair Brown, would you make the motion? Um, in the matter of uh, <clears throat> 647 Fifth Avenue, the George W. Vanderbilt residence, uh, an individual landmark. This is an application to install signage, awnings, and light fixtures. I recommend approval. Uh, noting that the existing ground floor facade and second floor balcony were reconstructed uh, pursuant to a commission level approval. Therefore, the installation of signage at these locations will not impact original or historic materials. That the proposed plaque signs adjacent to the ground floor entrance will be well scaled to the facade and 
feature a stone finish that will harmonize with the existing facade materials that the proposed dimensional lettering installed at the glazed storefront transoms will feature a, uh, a minimal projection and will not substantially reduce the transparency of these windows. Uh, that the proposed stone spandrel signage between the second and third floors will be installed uh, at an area of plain marble in a location that was previously approved for signage by the commission and that the use of dimensional letters in stone to match the facade will give it a discreet presence, that the presence of signage at the awning skirts at each floor will signify the commercial use of the upper floors and will be in keeping with the historic conversion of similar individual landmark mansions on Fifth Avenue from residential to commercial use, that the overall neutral color palette of the signage <clears throat> will blend with the existing materials and finishes of the facade and therefore will not call undue attention to itself and that the cumulative effect, a cumulative amount of signage will not overwhelm this individual landmark. Thank you. Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second. Vote. Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Chu? Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Master? Aye. With nine in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. All right, so that's approved. Thank you. We'll move to the next item. Next item is public hearing item number six, LPC 24-03061, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1493, lot 7504, 944 Park Avenue in the Park Avenue Historic District. This is an Art Deco style apartment building designed by George Pelham, built 1929 to 30, and the application is to replace the main entrance canopy. I always revert back to waiting for the staff person to introduce the, the uh, application. Uh, my name is Jackie Pudu Vallon, JPD Preservation Consulting. I'm here today with the architect, Bobby Becker. Um, Hi. Um, so this is 944 Park Avenue, um, an application to install a sidewalk canopy at the ground floor entrance that was altered in 1999. The building is located on the west side of Park Avenue between 81st and 82nd Streets. Uh, here's what the building looked like shortly after it was constructed in 1930. The ground floor openings featured simple incised molded surrounds that stepped back from the face of the building. I know it's hard to see in these, these photos. By the 1940s, a, side, a sidewalk canopy had been installed and some of the window openings had already been turned into doorways and additional windows had also been installed. And here's what the base of the building looked like in the 1980s. In these photos, you can better see those incised enframements that were part of the original design. Um, and at the right is the designation photo from uh, 2014. So here's what the base of the building looks like today. As I said, in 1999, the building's ground floor facade was entirely redesigned and reclad with new limestone panels. Um, so it has this sort of rustic rustication detail and these sort of pilasters flanking the the entrance and these uh, incised panels above the main entrance doors. Oh, incidentally, it also currently has an, an awning, uh, sorry, a canopy with a rounded or, or coached um, shape to it. Um, now, in approaching this application, we looked at um, we looked at other uh, George F. Pelham buildings uh, that face onto Park Avenue uh, in this district. This is eleven. Uh, sorry. Yeah, this is 1100 Park, which has a canopy that overlaps the decorative cast stone panels above the entrance. It also has a coached or rounded shape. This is 1120 Park, uh, which has a canopy set into the entrance, overlapping a, a transom window. And this is 1130 Park, which likewise, likewise has a canopy set into the entrance, again, overlapping a, a transom. So here are the existing and proposed uh, elevations. The proposed canopy on the right would meet LPC rules if it were not for the fact that it overlaps the masonry above the doorway. The height of the new canopy is dictated by the proposed doors, 
uh, which incidentally meet LPC rules and therefore we're not going to go into detail about the door re replacement. Um, but the proposed doors are taller than the existing doors. Um, and so for, for just for clearance purposes, the uh, new the new canopy is going to have to be taller to clear that. The bottom of the existing canopy is seven foot six inches above the sidewalk and the bottom of the proposed canopy is 10 feet above the sidewalk. And here's uh, just looking at the proposed side elevation, proposed section. This is a duplicate, skip that. Here are um, existing and rendered views for the proposed canopy, existing and proposed, more views of the same. Um, and just to reiterate, the decorative panels above the doorway that will be obscured by this canopy are not original to this building. The entire base of the building has been resurfaced in 1999. That's my, my uh, presentation, and we look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I think in one of the early photographs, the, mm -hmm. the canopy was also up high. Yes. And is that because the doors originally were tall doors? Um, you know, it's really hard to see okay. in the original image. So, I don't know. Okay. It's, I can't tell for certain. Okay. Any qu other questions? All right, let's see if we have any public testimony. Noting there is no one in the room to speak on this item, I'll turn it to Gregory to see if we have any remote participants. Thank you, Chair Carroll. We have one remote participant with their hand raised, that being Zainab Turan from the Friends of the Upper East Side. Zainab Turan, I am promoting you to panelist right now. Please unmute your line and state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Chair Carroll, Commissioners, uh, my name is Zainab Turan, and I'm speaking on behalf of Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District. Friends Preservation Committee does not object to replacement of the canopy. We urge that the applicants ensure that the anchors do not damage the historic facade material. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I do not see any further hands raised, so I will note for the record that Manhattan Community Board 8 recommends approval. And with that, I'll bring it back to you, Chair Carroll. Okay. All right. So we have supportive testimony. Is there anything you'd like to, any final statement? Okay. And commissioners, any final? Yes, Commissioner Jefferson. Is the inside of the canopy, is the inside of the canopy lit or just, just the surface? Yes, my apologies. I should have I should have included that here. And actually, we had that in an earlier iteration of the presentation, and somehow it got dropped out. Um, yes, we had a reflected ceiling plan for the canopy, and it will have um, recessed lights set within the fabric exactly. that follows the arch. Okay, so it's similar to what's there now. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So we need to close the hearing. Commissioner Ginsburg, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. The hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And we know, of course, that um, sidewalk canopies are a very traditional feature on apartment buildings of this age and style in, in all of our historic districts with this building type. And so, as Jackie said, this is and, and so we can do it at staff level, and, and as Jackie said, this is before us because of its placement, which um, is outside of the limits where the staff can approve sidewalk canopies, but we do know historically they often were above and, and had different relationships to the openings depending on their needs. Um, we also know this is not historic fabric at the base, so those panels that are partially concealed are, are uh, not historic details. Um, Commissioner Master, would you like to start this one? Yeah, I, I think that this is appropriate. Um, I think it makes sense. You're raising the height of the door. You know, you need the canopy to cover it. Um, you're covering some of the, you know, stonework. However, as uh, Commissioner Carroll said, that it's not historic. So I think it's appropriate. Okay, Commissioner Chu. Yeah, I, I mean, I find these situations challenging for everybody, including clients and, and applicants because the building is this building is is massive and the entry is tiny <laughs> and it doesn't give any cover um so this is really just sort of a a loose 
furniture piece solution to a historic facade and I think dealing with challenges you have in fact squashing it under the doors are too tall wouldn't really work and in fact it does feel oddly tall so I think acceptable. Okay, Commissioner Lutfi. Yeah, I uh, I agree with uh, Commissioner Master. This is appropriate. All right, Vice Chair Bland. I agree as well. All right, Jim. Commissioner yeah. Chen. Agreed. Agreed. And Commissioner Jefferson. Just a yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I think we all are in agreement. Commissioner Master, would you read the motion? In the matter of LPC-24-03061, 944 Park Avenue in the Park Avenue Historic District, an Art Deco-style apartment building designed by George F. Pelham and built in 1929-1930, application is to replace the main entrance canopy. I note that the building's style, scale, material, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historical character of the Park Avenue Historic District. I recommend approval finding that the base of the building was altered prior to designation and the decorative elements around the door in framement are not original. Therefore, the new canopy will not conceal any significant historic features that the height of the proposed canopy will meet the minimum clearance required by code and will allow the res restoration of full height doors to the entrance. That the placement, design and materials, details and finish of the proposed canopy are consistent with other canopies found on buildings of this age, style and type in the historic district. And that the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural or historic character of the Park Avenue Historic District. Thank you and Commissioner Chu would you second that motion. Second. All right, Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Chu? Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Master? Aye. With eight in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move to the next and final item. Last item is public hearing item number seven, LPC 24-06401, an application for a binding report in the borough of Manhattan, Block 122, Lot 1. Uh, advertised as a City Hall Park individual landmark. Uh, it is just outside of the boundaries of that on the sidewalk and therefore actually in the African burial ground in the Commons uh, Historic District. And this is a landscape park designed in 1870 and later altered by Robert Moses, 1935, the park is itself. Uh, and the application is to install a kiosk and bicycle racks. All right, please go ahead. Hi, thanks very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Phil Abramson. I'm a director with the Revenue and Concessions Division at the New York City Parks Department. I'm excited to speak with you this afternoon about a very important project we're working on with the Workers' Justice Project, just to give you a little um, summary before we get into the details of it. Um, we're proud to soon present a hub for delivery workers along the perimeter sidewalk of City Hall Park. This is an initiative that was announced during the fall of 2022 by Mayor Adams and Senator Schumer. We've worked very closely with the Workers' Justice Project and their design firm, Fantastica, on the design of this hub, along with the support of City Hall and the Department of Transportation. This proposed amenity is absolutely essential for the growing number of New Yorkers who use e-micro-mobility devices, especially for our city's hardworking uh, app delivery workers who provide food, groceries, and medicine for countless New Yorkers. Indeed, through inclement weather, air quality warnings, and the pandemic, delivery workers have put others first. I may have hit a button there, sorry. Uh, yet our delivery workers do not have central locations where they can get a brief respite from the elements, safely charge their e-bike batteries, charge their cell phones, repair their bikes, receive educational materials on street safety and safe battery charging, or just sit down and take a rest for a few minutes. This proposed delivery hub will provide these services not only for delivery workers, but for all New Yorkers. The hubs will also be fully staffed during peak delivery hours by the Workers' Justice Project, and their operations will be governed by a license agreement between New York City Parks and the Workers' Justice Project that will be subject to a vote of approval by the city's FCRC, the Franchise and Concession Review Committee. Now, we're proposing this site on the perimeter of City Hall Park because it is a central location to their delivery routes, and there is an existing piece of city infrastructure, a former newsstand, 
that has existing electrical connections and the structure does not serve any purpose any longer. With these existing electrical, it is best equipped to support the battery charging needs of this hub. So our delivery workers are very excited um, and, and very, um, they've spoken loud and clear in support of this hub. Uh, we look forward to providing this essential infrastructure that will benefit them and so many New Yorkers. And now I'd like to turn it over uh, to April. Thank you so much, Phil, and good afternoon. I'm April Kerms. I'm Deputy Director of the Workers' Justice Project. We are a not-for-profit organization that organizes and serves immigrant workers citywide, including app delivery workers. And we are thrilled to be partnering with the city, with NYC Parks, to present this first in the nation delivery to hub to landmarks today. Uh, the Commons by City Hall has a long history as a public space that has been used in the public interest. And our hub continues that tradition by providing a place where delivery workers that serve this community, as well as the general public, can rest, safely charge their e-bike batteries, and receive services and education on important topics such as street safety and workplace rights. It's very fitting that this historic location serves as an example for the city and the entire country of appropriate, sustainable ways to support app delivery workers and the growing use of e-micromobility devices. And we're very excited to present our vision to you today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tenzin to begin our call. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to clarify the design and the thought process that has gone into designing the kiosk. The application is to replace a non-historic newsstand installed on the sidewalk of City Hall Park in the 1980s with a micro-mobility battery charging bike repair and community kiosk. The sidewalk of City Hall lies outside the boundaries of City Hall's individual landmark, but is within the African burial ground and Commons Historic District. So in 1658, when New Amsterdam was granted independent municipality status by the Dutch government, the city limits extended beyond the walls to the area bounded by the Hudson and East River all the way to what was called the Freshwater today, Rain and Reed Streets. The area from Dutch East India Company farms to the Fresh River came to be known as the Commons and was available for use to everyone as pastures and to collect wood and raw materials. The first structure built by the European settlers on the commons was a windmill, which you can see in the picture right up there. There's in the corner, there's a windmill that you can see just east of Broadway and south of the current city hall building location in the vicinity of the new stand today. It was one of the two windmills that existed at the time. The old Fort Windmill was constructed in 1628 and ceased operations in 1663 and was available to everyone to use and a portion of the grains was kept aside to maintain the mill. The commons was used as government was used for government activities such as executions, open space, public gatherings to celebrate holidays and parade grounds. In 1736, New York City embarked on a transformative urban development phase and started the construction of public buildings. The secluded na nature of the commons at the northern edge of the city made it a perfect choice to locate welfare and punitive institutions. One of the first buildings that were built was a poor house, the Arms House, at the future location of the City Hall. The Arms House later evolved to become Bellevue Hospital, the first American public hospital. In 1730, John Harris acquired the windmill property and built a one and one half story at the southeast corner of the lot, just north of Murray Street, surrounded by an offense orchard. In the later part of the 18th century, developments in the commons include uh, the construction of St. Paul's Chapel, the city authorized the purchase of a portion of the northern part of the commons to construct Chamber Street, and in 1760, extended Broadway all the way from Ann Street to Reed Street. After the British evacuated uh, New York, the municipal government tried to make repairs to the building, but uh, by 1790, it was clear that the buildings had become obsolete. The commons had become an area that was a public nuisance, and the city enclosed the commons with a fence in 1785 and took on the work to place trees and picket fences to slowly create a public park. But the blocks facing the park and Broadway and Chamber Street had become a fashionable re residential neighborhood and by 1795 had been divided into lots and sold and almost instantly there were modest sized residential buildings that filled up the lot. 
Around the 1800s, the city felt the need for a new city hall to accommodate the needs of a growing American metropolis. New, new Amsterdam's first city hall had stood at 73 Pearl Street, which was Customs House, and had moved to a second location at Wallen Nassau, which was the Federal Hall. A design competition was held in 1802 and City Hall was built in 1803 to 1810, the designs of Rangen and Mangon. City Hall has been altered at least seven times in the last 200 years by various architects and is a mix of international architectural styles. Uh, the area around C City Hall has also constantly evolved in these 200 years. In the early 1800s, as you can see in the picture down, uh, the one to the far left, uh, there were low buildings that surrounded City Hall uh, there were, the entire lower Manhattan got burned down three times in fires in the early 1800s. There was a shortage of water in New York City, which was taken care of by the uh, construction of the Croton Aqueduct and the fountain that was placed around City Hall Park to commemorate that uh, Croton Aqueduct. Uh, in 1845, the construction of the A.T. Stewart Bu uh, Department Store Building uh, which is at the bottom, which was one of the first buildings that was a departmental store in, in the city, uh, uh, led to the commercialization of this neighborhood. Uh, in the latter part of the 18, 18, 19th century, uh, uh, with the construction techniques that had improved, as well as the introduction of elevators and buildings, the area saw a lot, uh, saw much taller buildings, which uh, resulted in the construction of the New York, New York Times uh, and the New York Tribune and the New York World Building around Park Road that formed the newspaper road. The New York World Building at, uh, was the tallest building that was built in the 1890 to 1894 uh, and was taller than the first building that was taller than Trinity Church. The 1900s were a period of rapid transformation and changes that occurred in the area, both above the ground and under the ground. With the completion of the Brooklyn Bridge in 1883 and the development of the subway system in 1903, the area around City Hall Park had become a transportation hub. The, the IRT, the city's first subway line, opened in 1904, and the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company, BMT, opened in 1913. These were both combined and connected underground under a single fare in 1948. Above ground, the area underwent radical transformation. The once low buildings that are surrounded City Hall were replaced by much taller buildings. The Woolworth Building designed by Cass Gilbert was the world's tallest building built, built uh, in 1913 and was once the tallest in the 1930s. 225 building, uh, 225 Broadway built in 1927, which is 44 stories tall. And in the 1960s, immediately across from the current location was built 250 Broadway, a 30, 30 story tall metal and glass building designed by Emily Roy. The New York World Building was demolished in 1955 to accommodate the ramp expansion of, at Brooklyn Bridge. In the 1980s, the current newsstand was installed on the sidewalk of City Hall Park, away to the south of the side entrance of City Hall on Broadway. The structure sits on a 35 feet wide sidewalk along Broadway. The newsstand itself is a watered down classical re replica with a few period details, often mistaken as being from the period of significance of City Hall. The decline of uh, newspapers rendered it, rendered it obsolete and it has been vacant for many years. To reuse the structure would require significant cost in retrofitting and restoration. As the, sig as the structure itself is not significantly historical or architecturally significant, the cost of restoration and adaptive use cannot be justified. The commons were historically a communal place, historically pastoral in the, in the 20th and 21st century, it has become a very important transportation hub. The installation of this kiosk will address urgent needs for another mode of transportation. Buildings and structures along Broadway reflect the various periods of history along all the way from the 1800s. The, com the commons has a history of buildings and structures that were built for a common purpose uh, from the windmills to the arms house, uh, barracks, prisons, and news stand, all demolished when the use had become obsolete. Uh, each of these structures reflect the style and materials of the period. The installation of the pre uh, proposed prefab kiosk at this location will be of the material and style of our age and is easily reversible. I'll just go through some of the visuals that you see as you walk by uh, the location. This is looking from Warren Street, which is a block not looking down. 
this is where the kiosk is. So it looks like very, very small, and you can hardly make it out in the streetscape. And as you walk down south, the, uh, the pictures are taken standing right across the street, but you can't fit, uh, other than the kiosk, nothing else fits because we're trying to take off the city hall as well. City hall just doesn't come within the frame of the picture. Going up, looking north uh, along the sidewalk, looking up, you see the structure, but again, city hall doesn't fit in that frame, and we see it like a bit of uh, Broadway. So the structure is more in context with Broadway and the changing landscapes that happen there. And uh, again, looking south uh, along the sidewalk, you see more of the, again, you see more of the avenue and the buildings that are on the avenue as opposed to seeing anything on the left or the presenting the designs of the land mines. Thank you, Tenzing, commissioners. So from a design standpoint, I would like to start Excuse with- Excuse me, can you, can you just, uh, state your name for the record? Can you just state your name for the record? Of course. J. Manuel Mancilla, I go by Man Man. Uh, from a volumetric comparison standpoint, you can see a side-by-side -side comparison of the existing newsstand and the proposed mobility hub. The proposed structure is five feet longer and three feet wider. It is also six feet taller. A side-by-side -side comparison of, the, of its footprint uh, shows how we are uh, taking over the space behind the existing newsstand. There is uh, some room there that we are taking over. And the important thing there is we're keeping the existing clearance between the fence and the front of the kiosk pretty much the same. Some additional site furnishings will be added in the form of new city racks on the south of the structure as well as an access zone adjacent to it uh, for easy as access on bicycles with the intent of keeping cyclists off the sidewalk. From a programmatic standpoint, the site plan shows uh, three sections in the proposed mobility hub. One module for information is a small office where a staff person will work on oper operating hours. A uh, charging module that is there for uh, a deliverista or any community member to come in and charge their phone or their batteries, as well as they need to rest. They can also get out of the elements and take a, take a breath in there. Uh, and a bike repair module, also available for any community member looking for a quick tune-up or a bike repair. A volumetric analysis on 3D uh, shows the structure from the City Hall Park side with the additional furnishings on the sidewalk. A view from the north at the bottom. And then from the Broadway side, you see the back of the mobility hub as well as the southeast corner. Here's an architectural context analysis. This is a complement to some of the images that Tenson showed previously uh, with a hyper-realistic render of the proposed mobility hub. So you can see it across Broadway in the two images up above, as well as from the north and south in the two images below. A side-by-side -side comparison of the proposed mobility hub from the north. As well as the back of it from the Broadway side. Now I would like to talk a little bit about the materials and finishes. Uh, the skin or the envelope of the structure will be mostly composed of uh, perforated uh, metal. 
as well as a uh, lighting element on the bottom of the crown uh, that is an LED strip. There is a station name, which will be backlit uh, 3D lettering. This will all be in a dark bronze color. Further on that, you can see a blown up axonometric showing the different components. So the skin will be powder coated aluminum in a dark bronze color. Um, the crown element, again, in dark bronze, is perforated aluminum um, skin. Tempered glass sides on north, south, and the west side of the structure uh, will be clear with an anti-graffiti film. Um, then a powder coated insulated aluminum panels for the roof, as well as a fiberglass grating aluminum substructure for the flooring. This is just sitting on top of the existing concrete slab in a dark gray color to try and match uh, the existing sidewalk. From the systems and features, this is all the, the, the systems incorporated into the design. Uh, the roll-up doors on the west side, as well as uh, sliding doors on the north and side, uh, on south, are activated or controlled by, via an access control panel. The charging technology was developed in collaboration with Los Deliberistas, Los Deliberistas Unidos by UNI, which is a micromobility startup. There will be an HVAC system for cooling and heating. These structures will be climate control. RGB LED lights for interior and exterior lighting. This includes the LED strip that I showed previously. Uh, race leveling platform with an ADA ramp and the mechanical hardware for all of those systems. Some of the op optional uh, features include a modular green roof, solar panels, a rainwater catchment system, and an irrigation tank to complement that. This is the, the last image that I will share with you. Uh, last uh, view from the south, showing some of the detail as well as the interior of the mobility comp. And now I will turn it over to all of you then. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, do we have questions, commissioners? Commissioner Goldblum? So if your ingress into the uh, pavilion is from the side that we're seeing here, the, the front, what are the flares for on the sides? The little, you know, the striped flares. Oh. Uh, you mean the striping on the floor? Yeah. Uh, it's an ADA ramp. Right, but it's an ADA ramp to, to no door. Is there a door on the side? Oh, so the doors on the sides are roll up doors. So on the sides or only on the front? Uh, yeah, it only there's, showed, it only showed up no on the front. Point, so I'll go over here. So these these three doors go up. Right. These are sliding doors. Oh, those are sliding yep. doors. Okay, yep. great. Thank you. Okay, yes, Commissioner Ginsburg. So it would seem to me that as part of this facility, you'd want bathrooms. Are there any bathrooms nearby? Is there a reason you didn't put bathrooms in this facility? Uh, City Council recently passed a law that requires restaurants to make their restrooms available um, to any delivery workers um, who um, go there to pick up an order. Um, so that, uh, plus the uh, cost prohibitive nature of installing uh, the restrooms is why it's not included in this. Thank you. Right. Uh, Commissioner Jefferson, followed by Commissioner Chu. Uh, is there a mesh on the roof? Is that what I'm seeing? Like, and, and, and why is that there? What, what's the purpose of that? I guess you want to speak about the roof material and structure? Uh, so there's the roof is is uh, made out of two components. One here again. There's no pointer, but um, the I'm going to try to do it with the mouse here. So. This triangular 
on the sides is sort of like a fascia. Uh, the reason it is perforated metal is to let sunlight and, and some lighting into the interior space, but also to hide, you know, to try and hide some of the hardware that goes on the interior of the mobility hub that is suspended from the roof, meaning, you know, like any duct or hardware of the door or uh, systems that are associated with the structure itself. Uh, the upper part of it is sort of like a fascia to keep rain and snow and to direct it to where it has to go. So it's a, it's a dual, uh, like a two component piece to the, to the crown element or the uh, roof structure. One quick, the, the sloping member and the vertical fascia, is that, the, the vertical fascia is not structure, right? It's just, no. The vertical, the, the vertical fascia is, uh, is just there to, uh, to hide some of, the, some of the hardware and systems on the interior of the structure. So the building doors fold up into it. Oh, okay. Here. So the, the, the geometry of it is driven, this mouse is very, very small, but I'm very slow, but I'm gonna try it. So this triangle there, it's basically the roll-up doors once they roll up. So the, the geometry of it was defined by the roll-up doors. And so the intent there is to protect and hide those roll-up doors, roll doors once they are up, as well as you know the, the modular green roof over it. So the, the skin is basically just containing those two mechanical aspects of the kiosk. All right, Commissioner Chu. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering if there, so the, the street side is opaque, right? The back of it, yes. yes. Right. Is there any way to get some transparency on that side or is it all taken up by your, your charging battery cabinets? Because it looks like they're, I guess my concern is only just visibility. These are little spaces and I also just wanted to ask about hours of operation. Is it open like that all the time? They shut it down at certain hours? Is it use, just public open use for 24 seven? So I'll answer your first okay. question about the back of the, of the kiosk. So this, this solid part, let's call it, it's where all of the right. hardware and systems are housed. Now, that is not to say that, you know, something could go over this, you know, needing uh, any placemaking feature that could be artwork or right. vegetation or anything of that kind. Um, originally, we had proposed the charging cabinets on the back of it, which is um, something that is native to the design, being mm -hmm. able to turn the, the cabinets uh, towards the back mm -hmm. of the kiosk. Uh, but that is not uh, something that is possible given this location. Right. Is this a custom design for this location or is there an intent that this might be mass produced, mass fabricated? It, it was designed with the intent yeah. of being mass uh, produced, uh, but it is right now specifically for Only this for location. This yep. And one last question is because it is located near a park and adjacent to trees, I just wondered if you guys had done uh, analysis for bird safety because it seems like a nesting ground for birds and all that turf area with the awning attachments and whatnot. And if that needs to be looked at more carefully so that it doesn't become a bird nesting issue. So the short answer is it will, uh, and and a lot of it. <laughs> but but I will I will add that a lot of it has to do with uh, whether or not we have some of those optional systems, such as the green roof and the solar panels, and so that will determine the final design of the oh. of the interior of the roof. And so at that stage, once we look at all the the, the systems that we will incorporate, you know, we will. Uh, Finalize the design. Correct. Not from an aesthetic or architectural standpoint, just from a system standpoint. Okay. 
Yeah. I just need to respond to the operating hours. Right. So we're still finalizing the operating hours as we negotiate our licenses and with parks. But yeah. the intent is to have the hub open and staff during peak delivery hours for delivery oh. workers. So that would be afternoon and, of course, the evening dinner rush. And when the kiosk is not open, those front doors will be the roll down front doors that are facing City Hall Park will be closed. But there are battery charging cabinets, as you can kind of see from a little screen in the back, that are outward facing. So some of the battery charging cabinets, which are accessible by an app, will be accessible 24 7 to delivery workers and members of the public. So next to this adjacent is where there will be, are there bikes? There's just a parking area to the side. There are bike racks. However, bike the racks. way that e bike battery charging works, which is something that I realized that we yeah. need to explain <laughs> as we start up. Uh, doing this is that you don't plug the whole bike in. Yeah. You take the battery out of the bike and you slide it into this cabinet. Mm -hmm. And for many delivery workers, they have more than one battery because they need to keep working. So the idea is they stop, they park their bike for a short while at one of the adjacent bike racks. They pull out their battery to charge it in the cabinet. The app will tell them when it's ready. Mm -hmm. They put in their spare battery and they ride off. And so it isn't that you have to plug an entire bicycle in there. And for that reason, we have some charging cabinets accessible from the interior when it's open, open. and other services are available, and others that will be accessible from the outside 24 seven. Thank you. Okay, so Commissioner Jefferson. Are we approving this as a final or just a process? Um, we're, this is a single proposal before us, and we're looking at it today in its entirety. Uh, yeah. We don't know if it's going to have green room for solar panels, mm -hmm. and that, that could all come some later day. Right. And I think um, it's something we can talk about as we talk through the design. I think right as it's proposed, the fascia is would conceal whatever that roof treatment is, whether it's solar panels or planted roof. Um, but we'll talk through that more um, when we get to the discussion. Any other questions? Yes. Commissioner Lutfi. Yeah. So this is like a prototype, correct? For the future. I don't know who's answering this. In a way, it, it's a prototype. Right now, we have two hubs planned, this one and one later on down the line for the Upper West Side, but they won't all be identical to this. This is a modular hub, which my money can get into more detail. If you want, there are, this hub actually has three different modules, as she showed, the bike repair module, the charging module, and the rest module, and depending on where we locate these, it's a smaller space, maybe we'll only have two modules. So this is, the intent is for these modules to be the same from location to location, but we may not use all of them. Right, but also, since it's the first one that you're doing, I'm just guessing that you're gonna learn based on what happens, who uses it, what's missing. You know, this is like, uh, this is a bad analogy, but you know, all over the city, there are these garages for taxis and where they can do whatever they need to do for messengers and even regular bikers who have electric bikes. This could be sort of an important hub, but you're gonna learn as you go. So I guess one of the things um, that I'm wondering is if that is the case, this one in particular, even if we approve it, may ultimately get modified and it may also inf then influence what happens later on. So there could be like a caveat associated with it somehow. Just, I'm just kind of thinking out loud and asking a question. I know we don't all know the answer, including you, but. I, I would say that's correct. I would say we're all learning as we go. No one else in the entire country has ever done it before. New York had a long history of being, you know, blazing a trail for these types of things. And we, we expect to learn as we go and adjust and pivot. And of course, not to stick with things that aren't working just because that's what we started out with right. and, and the idea is we will we will learn, we will ensure the long feedback from the community, from delivery workers, from the public as this rolls out since this there's nothing like this in the city and hopefully we can make improvements. The idea is to have it get better over time as we go. Yes, Commissioner Jefferson. It's a box. Do you need the columns? The whole up the roof? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you could you could cantilever, right? Uh, yes. I mean the the columns and the in the front, 
are sort of like what composes the, the each individual module, but also, you know, are there to provide the maximum amount of flexibility because the interior partitions can also be modified going from one location to the other. So they define the, the use case as, as from, a, from a programmatic standpoint and, and allow for the system to be modular. So as April was saying, you can, you can make one or two or three or more. Yeah, it's like Legos, so to speak. Yeah, for sure. And I, and I think the intent behind the, the, the design is to give the operator that flexibility, even, you know, to some of the, the previous points, as they go along and start learning from users, you know, to have the, 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 the power to adapt these as, you know, they're learning, right? So to have enough built-in flexibility so that the, that the UX and the and the and the architecture itself can be you know uh, adapted as they go. All right, Commissioner Chen. Yeah, uh, given that there have been a series of fires uh, related to the batteries, uh, three over the weekend, ten last uh, last week. Uh, ha what's the fire department involvement in this, and whether there are fire extinguishers in the uh, in the shed? Yeah, so we we are working together with with the FDNY in the development of the charging technology, and so we are working hand in glove with them in order to make sure that all of those all of the safety precautions necessary are in place. All right, other questions. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions now. We're going to move to public testimony. We may have more questions after that. Thank you, Sam. All right, so we have a number of people who have signed up to speak on this item. I just want to remind everybody that we welcome public testimony. Each speaker should start by stating their name, and um, and everybody has three minutes to speak. And we'll start with in-person testimony, and then uh, after we have finished with everybody who's in-person, we'll then move to see if we have any remote participants. So we're going to start with the sign-in sheets. I have Antonio Martinez Solas. Muchas gracias por la oportunidad de poder testificar a favor del Delivery Staff Hub en el City Hall. Eh, mi nombre es Antonio Solís, llevo aproximadamente cuatro años como deliverista. Eh, como deliverista he sido sometido a muchas dificultades, accidentes, robos, abusos laborales y la falta de una infraestructura digna. Eh, somos miles de los que hacemos este trabajo y lo hacemos con con orgullo porque es un trabajo que, que nos unifica. Llevamos más de tres años luchando por el sueño de tener nuestro primer deliverista hub y qué mejor hacerlo aquí en el parque del Cítico. Este espacio es una necesidad para el trabajador que hace uno de los trabajos más peligrosos de la ciudad y más precarios. Este deliverista hub es un ejemplo de cómo nuestra ciudad puede innovar para crear acceso a estaciones de carga eléctrica para cargar las bicicletas y poder seguir educando a la comunidad de liberistas. Esta zona del City Hall Park tiene uno de los usos más altos de servicios de entrega de alimentos en la ciudad. Lo que hacemos pidiendo es poder hacer nuestro trabajo mejor, de una manera más organizada y que nos proteja como trabajadores, para que podamos seguir ofreciendo los bienes y servicios esenciales a los clientes en la zona. El centro propuesto hará eso por nosotros. Necesitamos una infraestructura adecuada. Podemos hacer que este trabajo sea más seguro para todos los deliveristas y residentes. Pero tenemos que actuar ahora. No recibimos ninguna ayuda de las empresas de aplicaciones por esto. 
Por lo tanto, estamos ofreciendo una solución única a nosotros mismos. Como trabajador, tiene que presentarse a un lugar de trabajo y esperar a ese lugar sea seguro. Como repartidores, la calle es nuestro lugar de trabajo. Al igual que todos, queremos poder hacer nuestro trabajo bien y de manera segura. Uh, what he said. So my name is Antonio Solis and I've been doing app, app delivery work for four years and I've been experiencing many challenges uh, from accidents, um, bike thefts, and um, the lack of infrastructure. Um, we do this work very with pride and with dignity. Um, we've been um, dreaming of having a dignified space for the last three years and the this delivery is the hub. Um, has been our dream. And what a better way to actually start and doing it in the park, near the park of City Hall. Um, here, we're here showing real solutions um, to existing problems that exist in our city. Um, and we're here we have uh, opportunity to deliver solutions that allow celebrities of not only to have a dignified space, but actually to do this work more safely in an organized way, as we continue to use these spaces to educate and organize other workers. Um, and offer real um, solutions to the issues that we're experiencing. We need infrastructure. We need to do it now. We're hoping um, that we can um, work together to make sure that we do this together. And as delivery workers, um, we're hoping always to come back to our families with safety um, and with um, and being able to continue to do this work. And we're hoping um, that this initiative uh, that we're proposing today um, that allow us to do this job with more dignity. And we're hoping to count with your support to make this a reality. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Gustavo, uh, oops, uh, Aish, forgive my pronunciation. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gustavo Che, and I'm a delivery worker in New York City uh, for more than 20 years. So. The natural district is my area for a long time. And as you know, in this area, there is not uh, like a bike repair or bike shop. So most of the time when the city, the, the city get hit by like a crazy weather. So sometimes we got flat, we have to go all the way down to uh, Chinatown and it's not easy for us. So that's why we focus in this location to bring solution to all these essential workers that serve New York during the hardest time that happens everywhere, or mostly in the city. But this hub is gonna be such a lot of help for us because this is gonna be a place where we can go there and repair our bike and charge the body. As you know, there's a lot of concerns and about the fire, what happened with virus now. So this is how we come to this end to bring solution because as a delivery worker now, I don't have no choice to have to bring my battery home, so I have to charge the battery home. So this made my situation 80 cent or thousand or more work because used to be you leave the bodies in the uh, parking garage or the, the parking lot that we're renting for monthly, but now we're not allowed to do that no more because everybody's scared. They don't want us near there, they don't want these bodies near their house, so we have to bring it home. So, to bring safety in the city, this is why this is so necessary for us to bring solutions. We have to focus on solutions. That's what we do in Hasa, Los de Luristas Son Unidos and Working Justice. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Christopher Leon Johnson. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. My name is Christopher Leon Johnson. And I'm speaking on opposition to the project. Now, people might ask me, like, why I'm wearing this shirt is because this organization right here is called Trevor Alternatives, and they control this organization called LDU, aka Local Justice Project. This organization is a big island, so I'm this shirt. So, keep it real, the reason I'm against this pub because the people that are speaking here in uh, support of the project, they're not really real resistors. This lady right here from Galapa, she's a technical consultant for Berlin Rosen. And these guys are here to fight for the project. They're nothing but faithful of the Um, One more, Gustavo Chibi mentioned that he's a construction worker. He's a full-time construction worker. He does the barista as a part-time thing. He don't know the real aspect of being a real barista. Um, this thing is nothing back by, this is, I understand that Chuck Schumer is doing this project, but we not. We should be against this. Community Board 1, Community Board 1 that's located in this building 
um, not that far from me, but upstairs, they voted down the project. They they said no to this project. They didn't even say yes to modifications. They didn't even say um, they didn't even say anything. No, no, no modification. They said straight, flat out no. So if the community board that is one of the most wealthy districts in the city of New York say no to this project, including community board seven, which is located on the west side, say no. You guys should be saying no too to this because if wealthy people say no, you guys should be saying no. If wealthy people say yes, you guys should be saying yes. So at the end of the day, this the, the reason I'm against this is because this organization, they are not telling you the real truth about what's going on. One one the example directly of Nikki Galapa, because of the fact that she is her organization is another vanity project to a nonprofit that based in Boston, Massachusetts, not even New York State. Not even New York City, not even Westchester. They're based in Boston, Massachusetts. Her organization, um, organization project is done with a vanity project that is based under is under Boston, Massachusetts. So the organization that's behind this is a joke. Um, organization project. The whole concept is a joke, and I hope that you guys shut it down, vote it down today, or whatever means you can. Um, like I said, these people back here, these people, all you guys, Gustavo, Antonio, William, and the other cat. They're not real deliveries, deliveries. So they all get paid. They all got these speeches wrote up by Liggy Galapa to say what they got to say. So don't believe anything those poor got to say. Liggy wrote their speeches. Um, they just say what Liggy tell them to say. They don't even run their own social media accounts. Liggy is typing everything in for them. She controls the social media account. So everything about these guys and her, it's all it's all fake. It's all an illusion. So vote this project against it. I'm against this project. They say no to this. Vote it down today. Thank you. No to this project. Thank you. Thank you. Alejandro Cajales. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alejandro Grajales. I am a member of the Worker Justice Project uh, and leader of Los Deliveristas Unidos. Uh, I am testify testifying in support of the Deliverista Hub at City Hall. Um, eight years ago, I started working as a delivery worker in this neighborhood. Since then, I have been transporting food, medicine, and other essentials on pedal bikes and e-bikes. Since more and more New Yorkers rely on our work to stay home safe during heavy rains, snow, snow storms, and other emergencies, our existence as deliveristas is essential to this city. Our labor has helped keep New Yorkers safe during the pandemic, and we continue to do essential jobs, especially when this city needs us the most. We are capable of delivering anything and everything on two wheels. And as our work continues to change, most of us rely on e-bikes to do this job. E-bikes can become a necessity and a job requirement for all of us in this industry. While we continue to advocate for policy solutions to address the hazards and fires caused by lithium batteries, we are in the front line offering solutions that will make our city better for everyone. The proposed deliverista hub at City Hall is the 21st century solution that our city needs to to confront the issues of e-bikes, fire, fires, and street safety. We are living in a new era that requires change and innovation. And our Deliverista Hub design represents that the new era that is about accepting our existence, recognizing our humanity, and together delivering innovative solutions that do meet the new reality of our city. We strongly support the Deliverista Hub design and it fits perfectly the new era of innovation. We look forward to counting, counting with your support to deliver the first Deliverista Hub in the country that will focus on the educating workers about street safety, offering e battery charging solutions and resource hub for app delivery workers. Thank you so much. Thank you. William Medina.
Thank you. Emily Jacoby? Hi, thank you for listening um, to my uh, statement of support. My name is Emily Jacoby. I work with transportation alternatives and I'll be giving our testimony um, in support of this hub uh, very strongly. Um, we are an advoc advocacy org and we fight for safe, sustainable and people focused New York City streets. Um, we express full support for this deeply needed and contextually appropriate delivery to transportation rest hub. And we see this as having both citywide reach in terms of showing the commitment here to really taking safety seriously and also laying the groundwork for more community solutions to safety across the city. Currently delivery work is one of the most dangerous professions in New York City. And these hubs should totally be prioritized where they will be of most service to the community. And that means both workers and those who are ordering delivery, bringing the workers right to their backyards. Um, this design is both responsive to the community needs of lower Manhattan residents while addressing the tech safety and quality of life challenges delivery workers can with every day. E-micromobility is an important piece of the puzzle of building a climate resilient future. It's important that neighborhoods across New York City take steps to ensure that battery safety is prioritized and education as well as infrastructure all come together to make it very easy for delivery workers to make this choice. We know the city has fallen short on ensuring everyone from elderly pedestrians crossing busy intersections to moms dropping off their kids on cargo bikes can safely navigate our streets. This kiosk is a step towards ensuring street safety and workers' justice are prioritized for our city's most vulnerable. We see this hub as an important first step as part of a holistic safety strategy to ensure our streets and public plazas are welcoming places for all who need to work, commute, recreate, and rest. We know we need more infrastructure to make safety for all mode users a reality, but currently more than 65,000 app-based deliveries does in New York City work through rain, shine, snow to deliver to New Yorkers. Creating more supportive infrastructure will help ensure all who access the public way experience safety order and designated space to rest between work. And more importantly, it's important to just designate space so that 
we have fewer conflicts on the sidewalk. We know there are certain places for everyone to go to be safe, but we have more order on our streets and our sidewalks. And I just wanna say that marginalizing and villainizing the presence of deliveries in our public spaces often happens at local meetings. Um, I'm happy I, there hasn't been much of that here, um, but these are hardworking people who are here delivering goods and services to their neighbors and are often incentivized by app companies to make dangerous trips that are inhumane in windows of time that no one should be able to fulfill. Um, let's embrace the reality of our public facilities and adapt and welcome these new technologies here. I think this is a really opening. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Is there anyone else in the room who would like to speak on this item? All right, not seeing anyone else. Um, I will turn it over to Gregory Kala to see if we have any remote participants. Thank you, Chair Carroll. We have a few remote participants in our attendees list. The first we'll be hearing from is Alice Blank from Manhattan Community Board One. Alice Blank, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. Please unmute your line and state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Alice Blank. I'm an architect who lives and works in Lower Manhattan, and I serve as vice chair of Manhattan Community Board One and chair of the board's Environmental Protection Committee. CB1 would like to make very clear that the board fully supports the laudable goal of instituting exterior battery charging stations and rest areas in the city in support of the city's delivery workers. The board, however, opposes the proposed new, new 300 square foot prefabricated building designed by Fantastica as appropriate for the proposed location in front of City Hall Park. In introducing the Deliveries to Hub program in 2022, Mayor Adams and Senator Schumer stated that the program would, and I quote, renovate and transform underutilized structures on city properties. This excellent idea confirming the city's commitment to sustainability through adaptive reuse was unfortunately abandoned in favor of replacing two of Manhattan's existing newsstands with a new large scale prefabricated building at, as an alleged cost saving measure. The existing kiosk at the city hall site is in sound condition and at 145 square feet unquestionably lends itself for adaptive reuse for battery storage, seating and bike repair. The existing kiosk was designed to harmonize with the surrounding historic context, including the existing fencing, benches, subway stanchions and other kiosks in and around city hall park. There is absolutely no reason to tear down the ex existing kiosk, which mirrors the historic context and furnishings of city hall park and replace it with a 33% larger new structure that encroaches on an additional approximate 33% of the critically needed open sidewalk space. This is a highly traffic location frequented by tourists, residents, workers, and demonstrators, and it demands particularly careful consideration to preserve pedestrian flow and historical integrity. If the city aims to spend the federal $1 million grant on a new prefabricated structure, then it should be directed towards locations where no usable structures exist for adaptive reuse without compromising pedestrian movement and historic neighbors, and should be modified to include other important public amenities like public bathrooms. Recently, the city launched an e-battery pilot program in five locations, the closest in Cooper Square, featuring small battery lockers that could easily fit within the existing newsstands at City Hall and elsewhere. It would seem fair and highly reasonable to add a pilot location in City Hall Park to assess its impacts prior to demolishing an existing structure and building a new permanent one. CB1 asked the commissioners to reject the new proposed prefabricated modular building and encouraged the applicant to reconsider the original intent of the Deliveriesta Hub program to repurpose existing underutilized newsstands at City Hall Park and elsewhere for e-bike storage and seating. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next up, we will be hearing from John Graham from the Victorian Society of New York. John Graham, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. 
please unmute your line and state your name for the record. You will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners. John Graham for the Victorian Society in New York. The Victorian Society supports the installation of the small hoop bicycle racks that are a secondary part of this application. They are not the sort of electrified racks that serve as recharging stations for electric powered city bikes. They have a small footprint, are finished in a dull metal, and will be quite unobtrusive. We believe they won't noticeably affect City Hall or the park. Regarding the proposed demolition and new structure, the application makes no mention of two important facts. One is that the proposed kiosk is also within the African burial ground and the Commons Historic District. As the designation report makes clear, this historic district fully protects above ground features as well as those below. Second is that the park underwent a curb to curb reconstruction in 1999. That work restored a number of missing historic features and added some new features in traditional styles. The historic park today encompasses the neoclassic city hall and perimeter fence, the eclectic Victorian Tweed Courthouse and Calvert Vaux Fountain, the classical, classical revival lampposts and subway entrances, and historic landscape features from several eras. The result is a harmonious whole. The Victorian Society does not support the proposal to demolish the existing newsstand and construct the proposed bicycle repair shop and charging station. The new stand pavilion is a modestly scaled, well-detailed, classically inspired feature that fits this setting. It reflects extant historic features, such as the BMT subway entrances, lampposts, and fountain, the now lost IRT entrances, and the newer classically inspired security booths, subway elevator, and reconstructed fence. It's typical of other such features in historic parks and in similar settings in the city. Its harmonious relationship to the rest of the park's features and the surrounding traditional buildings, many of which are designated, makes it unobtrusive and draws no attention away from City Hall. The proposed repair shop is the antithesis of the existing structure. The large windows, cantilevered roof, rounded corners, illuminated sign, and LED strip lighting demand attention. It has no relationship to or respect for the park's design or for a building which the designation report describes as the most beautiful city hall in the United States. It strikes a false note in its setting. We also believe a legitimate concern is the reduction of public sidewalk space caused by the larger building and its sloped apron. It's also likely that this type of activity will spill out beyond the structure's footprint. We urge the commission to deny the construction of the proposed structure and urge the applicants to adaptively reuse or sensitively modify the existing kiosk. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next up, we will be hearing from Lucy Levine from the Historic Districts Council. Lucy Levine, I am promoting you to panelist right now. Please unmute your line and state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hi, Commissioners. My name is Lucy Levine. I'm speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HDC supports deliveries to hubs, but finds the size and design proposed here inappropriate because it is not related to the context of City Hall Park. Deliveries are a vital part of our city, and they belong here. And the deliveries to hubs should be designed to belong as well. We wonder why the original plan for adaptive reuse, which we think was an excellent idea, was not carried out. The existing kiosk is designed to echo the IRT subway architecture found in this district. That nod to, to the subway is a nod to the public grandeur that early subway architecture was meant to evoke. By incorporating that vocabulary, the current kiosk offers the idea that the sidewalk furniture, which is placed on the public right of way, should enliven the public experience. We believe that the new deliveries to hub is a necessary public good and that it should also enliven the streetscape. We ask the design team to adapt this kiosk and take the same care in designing the adaptive reuse for this deliveries to hub as they would for any project in a historic district with context in mind. Deliveries does, like all New Yorkers, deserve good design. Thanks. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next up, we will be hearing from Eric McClure from Streets Pack. Eric McClure, I am promoting you to panelist right now. 
please unmute your line and state your name for the record. You'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Eric McClure. I'm the, the executive director of Streets PAC, a political action committee and advocacy organization committed to improving the safety of streets, the efficacy of public transit, and the quality of public spaces in New York City. I'm here to express Streets PAC's strong support for the proposed Deliverista Hub facility on Broadway adjacent to City Hall Park. The creation of this hub will offer deliveristas a place to rest between deliveries, refuge from the elements, safe battery charging facilities, a space to repair bikes, and access to essential services related to worker protections, and the facility will be open to members of the public as well. We firmly believe that, in addition to addressing the unique needs of delivery workers, the chosen site is ideally suited to serving the workers and the broader community. It's centrally located and proximate to several places at which deli de deliveristas typically gather due to the neighborhood's high delivery volume. We also believe that the proposed design is appropriate and aesthetically pleasing with a clean, easily maintained facade that wisely doesn't aim for faux historic appeal. Its low key color palette will in no way detract from City Hall or the neighboring City Hall Park. Lastly, this, faci this facility will serve as proof of concept for delivery worker hubs and it presents the Landmarks Preservation Commission with an opportunity to lead the city forward in supporting these essential workers. We urge you to lend your support to the proposed design and location. Our offices are nearby, and we believe the proposed facility and its design will enhance the community. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next up, we will be hearing from Jeremy Woodoff. Jeremy Woodoff, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. Please unmute your line and state your name for the record. You will have three minutes to three minutes to speak. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Jeremy Woodoff, uh, but I'm speaking neither for myself today nor for the Victorian Society. I instead am reading the testimony uh, prepared by George Volonikas, who was in the uh, Zoom meeting but had to leave. Um, his testimony is as follows. My name is George Volonikas, the landscape architect who, in the 1990s, redesigned City Hall Park and its surroundings, including the Brooklyn Bridge approach and Millennium Park, the park's southern tip. I am here today to speak against the proposed delivery kiosk and charging station, replacing the new stand along the historic perimeter of City Hall Park. The extensive restoration of City Hall Park in 1999 included the perimeter sidewalks and plaza along Center Street. The park's perimeter, as well as the park itself, were faithfully restored to the beauty of the 19th century. The renovation emphasized the important periods of the park's history while interpreting its rich heritage, both historically and architecturally, and pays tribute to our city's past while looking forward to the future. Our scope of work during this extensive renovation also included security features primarily along its perimeter. Our design challenge for this security component was to create new features that would be best suited to the historic fabric, the park setting. This is very opposite from what is being proposed today. The park features that were reintroduced along the park's perimeter included the 1817 Mangan and Macomb decorative iron picket fence ornate entrance gate post at the park entrances and the stone entrance ensembles at City Hall and the park's southern entrance. The perimeter sidewalks were also paved with large granite slabs and granite street curbs found within historic districts. We also reintroduced the Fifth Avenue cast iron street pole and luminaire, a Victorian newsstand now proposed for removal, and worked closely with the MTA to retain the decorative subway entrances as well as stone footprints found in our sidewalks and within the park, detailing the history of buildings that once occupied the space and events that have taken place here. City Hall's location was established so that there would be a dramatic view of the facade from the South and Lower Broadway. And today the park is surrounded by some of New York City's most valued historic landmarks. I note these park features because the perimeter sidewalks are a vital part of the overall park and its surroundings. During this extensive renovation, the Landmarks Commission 
took a major role in the park's restoration and preservation and understood the importance of the park furnishings appropriately situated as an overall vocabulary for the park and its perimeter. I urge the commission to reject the, this proposal for its inappropriateness to its surroundings. This proposed structure is best suited for Hudson Yards, not City Hall Park. The perimeter sidewalks of City Hall Park were designed an, as an extension to the park and a welcoming approach for all New Yorkers and tourists alike. Thank you from George Volonikas. Thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we will be hearing from Bob Martin. Bob Martin, I am promoting you to panelist right now. Please unmute your line and state your name for the record. You will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, yes, we can yes. hear you. Yes, 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 everybody. My name is Bob Martin. I am a New Yorker that works at McDonald's and I do work, I do city releases every day, busting their behinds for the New York City people to deliver their food and make minimum wage. But I am of opposition to this delivery star hub. The reason I'm against this hub is because we have a few people that so-called represent the delivery stars and that never deliver food, like Mr. Gustavo Achieve who I found out that he's a construction worker. He's not a delivery star. And then you the other guys, they're not that delivery stars. They're fake delivery stars. And they're getting paid by Ligia Galapa, who's a consultant to Bella and Rosan and all these consultant organizations like Chevrotation Alternatives. The issue is the project is a, a sham, everybody. It's a joke, everybody. People in New York City have to wake up to the situation, everybody. There's a lot going on in New York City. If you go by City Hall, it's so small. I cannot walk through. I work at the McDonald's on Broadway by the by Wall Street. I walk there every day to see what's going on in government in New York City. I can make minimum wage. And it's not, it's too small, everybody. Please, God, please commission us. Oppose this project. This project is a joke. It's small. You have to go there. It's impossible to do it there, everybody. Ligia is lying to you guys. Gustavo is lying to you guys. Antonio is lying to you guys. The people at this so-called organization called Terrorization Alternatives, they're lying. They're lying, everybody. New York, you have to wake up. Please oppose this project. Please oppose this uh, thing, please. It's not it's not right for anybody, me, including me, the McDonald's worker that I woke up to every day. Why do I have to see that? I don't want to see that. Nobody had a problem with the news done. This is nothing but a cash grab for the Ligia Galapa, and she needs to mention that Christopher Leon Johnson was right. Her organization based in Massachusetts. It's not a real not profit. It's a big nonprofit. It's only an organization in Massachusetts. Ligia, where is the money going? Why did you steal the money? Why did you steal my money? You stole my money. Where is that? Bad. Approve this project. Please oppose it. Please shut it down. Let it up. Pay the money back. Pay the money back. Let it up. Gustavo, you're fake. The not the Larista. Okay. You're phony. Oppose it. Please. It's not a real project. No to this issue, please. Please vote it down. This organization is fake. It's not a real organization. Thank you so much for your testimony. No, the travel. Okay. I do not see any further hands raised in our attendees list. So I will note for the record that we also received copies of letters of support sent to Community Board One from five people, including Comptroller Brad Lander and S Senator Chuck Schumer. We also received letters from the New York City Taxi Workers Alliance recommending approval as well as the Chinese American Planning Council recommending approval and a letter from the New York Landmarks Conservancy that was shared with commissioners as well. And with that, I'll bring it back to you, Chair Carroll. All right. So I'd like to ask if you'd like to respond to the testimony. And I do want to just note that, um, you know, the, the use and the merits of the use are not technically before us. We are looking at the 
presence of it within the African burial grounds and commons historic district. And so we're looking at placement, size, location, materials, and design. So feel free to limit your comments to those aspects. Respond a little bit saying that uh, we have definitely heard and thought very hard about many of the concerns the community has brought about the, the new stand, the more historic look. We did explore adaptive reuse and it would be a lot more expensive to do. And given that we are using a limited federal grant to uh, to make these sort of release to hubs happen, we wanted to make the most efficient use of federal dollars possible. And after exploring those possibilities and realizing that our funds would go further if we did not reuse the hub, we started thinking about what else we could do instead. We view this as an essential piece of transit infrastructure for what is frankly a very high tech purpose, which is app delivery service that you place via the internet that is delivered to you via e-bikes. And in that sense, we feel it is quite appropriate for the use that we are making of it, as well as conceptually appropriate for the buildings right across the street on Broadway and as transit infrastructure, um, contextually appropriate for things such as the city bus shelters. There's one right on the other side of City Hall Park and others along Broadway that definitely do not have a historic look. They have a more modern look as the MTA modernizes its look as well. I think one of our slides showed that the historic looking entrance to the R train there along that same stretch has a big LCD screen with flashing signs and things like that. So there are definitely nods to technology along City Hall Park. Um, we definitely respect the history of City Hall Park, but also respect that history in the sense that it's a history of progress and a history of using the site as the public needs it. And right now there is a need as even our opposition has noted for these facilities for delivery workers. This neighborhood is one of the neighborhoods with the highest use of app delivery work. And so that's ultimately how we landed on this design, though we are continually open to, to feedback, especially from the commission on any changes that you might have. So when we looked at the particular site in question, we looked at the history of the commons. And as we looked at this, we saw that uh, during this whole period of about 400 years, buildings came, they were built, they were used, and then they were demolished when they became obsolete. And however, each of these buildings represented the building style, materials, technology, and the design of the day, right? So we did not want to go, with, go back to something that was not reflective of the period. We looked at something that would reflect the current now. And I, I think someone put it like, this is more something that you put in the Hudson Yards. Like, you know, that's exactly what we went for. It, re it reflects the kind of design currently. And it's something that is also uh, a very, uh, a reversible design, as in this particular structure, can be taken out and dismantled at any point. So uh, it is not going to be destructible to the historic fabric. So, so that's something that. Uh, okay. And then just also, this his particular historic district is also has um, is significant for its below grade resources. So can you speak a little bit about the footings and the potential impact? So with, or lack with of. regards to this particular structure, there's not going to be any excavations. Uh, there is already uh, an electrical uh, uh, point that is here with the current structure, which we'll be reusing, which is one of the reasons why we said this is reversible. Uh, it's going to be placed on top of the slab, that concrete slab that is there currently, uh, and it will not damage any stubble stone flags or anything. So, yeah. Okay. Any other final questions, commissioners? Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Master and then Commissioner Chu. Sorry, so you said that the electrical conduit is there, so it has actually enough power to yeah. generate the force? Yes, okay. that's okay. Thank you. In terms of its location, I, the sidewalk there is quite wide on that side of the park. This is a little wider on your plan. It was hard for me to read what was so left it, for walking. So it's a 30-foot wide sidewalk, okay. and we're going to use 15 of it, and there's still 15 for walking. And, and the, the ramping, is that in the dimension of clear or not? The ramp, the ramp that goes up into the PI. I think up that's up about up. a foot, I think, right? Yeah. No, like it is not. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be taken on the budget fund. That's what we're looking at. Uh, 
So the ramp is not included in that dimension. It's not. It no. will it will be dependent on the height of the platform over the existing concrete slab. So it'll it'll be you know give and take twelve to eighteen inches okay. depending so on the height of the. Just in terms of its practicality, because I think that this is really needed, and it'll there will be a lot of bikers or, or workers that will use the facility. They will enter in from the sidewalk side, so that ends up taking a lot of space to, to go into there and come out. I just want to make sure that we have the proper sidewalk for pedestrians after that. Yes, I mean the 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 from a from a UX standpoint. The hub has the possibility of being accessed from all three sides. Mm -hmm. The idea is that on a nice day like today, mm -hmm. you know, the hope the hub will open up to the community and mm -hmm. invite, you know, community members to come in looking for whatever of those three services that will be provided yeah. at this specific location. And and as such, you know, it needs to be represented with a ramp on all three sides because of the the, the need for you know, committee members to access from. I side. understand. I, yeah. I guess what I'm just trying to do is set certain parameters for us so that every case there's something that we can look at. I mean, we spend time looking at restaurant uh, sidewalk cafes, which in many ways are similar to this. And a lot of the workers who the services are working for those restaurants and those have certain standards. How much sidewalk do you need to clear? I just want to make sure that with the working that happens at that, we still have that amount of width left. So let me also add that when the all of these doors are open, the hub will be staffed. And part of the staffing role will be to make sure that mm -hmm. the sidewalk stays or clear, clear and the pedestrians can get by. That mm -hmm. was one of the main visions of having the staff, in addition to providing all the services, is to making sure that pedestrians can get by, that there are no spikes on the sidewalk, that all of the community concerns that we hear about delivery workers and bike users separate from our hub are, are addressed when we bring a hub to this location. All right, Vice Chair Bland. Quick question. Um, I heard that bike repair will be part of the option. Is that just for the uh, delivery workers or for anybody riding a bike that has a flat? All right, any other questions, commissioners? All right, so I think we'll move to our discussion. Um, Commissioner Goldblum, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. So the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion and I just want to set the stage uh, with a couple of items for context. One is um, that this is an individual one-off application that is before us. And so we are binding both on design and location in this case. Um, should this become a larger citywide plan, um, that would then be reviewed by the Public Design Commission and we would revert to our advisory role with the exception of uh, location. So um, that's just an explanation of our regulation. The other thing that um, we all should be thinking about is that this is in the African Burial Ground and Commons Historic District. And this is a historic district that um, is a little unique it regu in that it, it uh, regulates both work that affects below, pot below grade potential effects on below grade resources. And, um, and then with respect to the commons area, ha we have also regulated uh, improvements, streetscape improvements and other installations along the streets. Um, with respect to the buildings that are within the African Burial Grounds and Commons Historic District, unless they are individual landmarks, we do not regulate design changes. We issue certificates of no effect for other kinds of changes. So it's really about the below grade resources and the commons. And so we will be evaluating the size placement design of this and material of this in the context of the commons, which the applicants have given us a history of and talked about the changes that have occurred um, throughout the history of the commons. And City Hall Park, which is a separate individual landmark adjacent to this 
uh, the site. So um, with that context, we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Ginsburg, would you like to start this one? So as somebody who lives and works near here, I appreciate the need for this facility. And this seems to me to be a pretty reasonable location for the facility, given the wide sidewalks, et cetera, the existing power. It also, in terms of the uh, burial ground, is not in any way disturbing anything below grade. So I don't think that is an issue. Uh, my one comment on the design is, is I think the front um, perforated panel could be cut down to be a little less bulky and to make the building just to seem a little less big, for want of a better word. But in general, I think this is a reasonable proposal at a good location. Thank you. Commissioner Chen? Yeah, I sort of uh, also agree with Commissioner Ginsburg that uh, the, the location is appropriate. Um, I, I do know that the burial ground is not near here. Uh, it's much further to, to the construction of the town. Uh, my, uh, given that this is a first trial, um, I I would encourage the applicant to uh, experiment, uh, and uh, especially with the material that's being used on the rooftop, and and also given the flammability, uh, given the current state of the lithium battery, uh, unless the new type of batteries are, are installed, uh, I, I would carefully look at the, uh, the fire protection system as well. Uh, and I also like to get that they're not disturbing the ground, because I know there's some way underneath it, uh, in the nearby area. Uh, so, but I agree with Commissioner Kim that the overall this is an appropriate location. Okay, Commissioner Bland. Um, likewise, I think. Um, yeah, it's hard to associate this visually, uh, only intellectually, I guess, with the African burial ground. Uh, it's easier to associate it with City Hall Park and City Hall itself, which I also kind of reject. To me, this is street furniture and uh, visually, and uh, it relates to the street, whether that um, is an appropriate thing for Landmarks Commissioner to be saying, I'm not sure, but it, it just is. It's already been noted uh, by Commissioner Chu that this is like a bus shelter, like a restaurant, part of the city street system. Um, I've walked this um, block for, I don't know, 40 or 50 years now, and I find it to be one of the more unpopulated sidewalks in its width and um, just general density. So I have, I mean, if, to the degree that there's density on Broadway, there is, but it's often on the other side of the street. Um, <clears throat> so I don't really have a, a problem with the size. Uh, given the uh, the testimony, or some of it at least, I was intrigued to understand how and why the um, existing couldn't be adaptively reused. Uh, I frankly reject the idea that it, it, it is somehow historic or relates to historic elements, uh, uh, even if it is not itself historic. Uh, but I, I was comforted by the explanation of, uh, of why it's not really feasible to adaptively reuse it. Um, I support the uh, contemporary design approach. I think our city streets are filled with contemporary, appropriately contemporary elements. Um, and I think uh, the, the, the function uh, of what's happening here, it needs to be accommodated in the form of the building, which I think it, it is. Um, it's been suggested that maybe the, the front part is too high or something, but I think the way the, the roll-up um, doors work, they bend, and that's kind of a cool design, I think, the way the, that bending is taken uh, care of. Um, you see it in other restaurants and things, but not elegant, not so elegantly designed as this. I don't think the scale is off. It's a big open space. This is a one-off, so I'm speaking about this site and this building only. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I will just say, as a citizen of New York, I hope that uh, you're successful here and that this can be uh, repeated 
if not replicated, at least repeated in use uh, around the city. Commissioner Lefty. Um, so I, I'm just, I had to step out for a minute, but I'm getting the gist of the fact that the uh, existing kiosk really couldn't be uh, retrofitted effectively to be used. Uh, so that takes that off the table. But, and I'd also note that it is, you know, a 1990s structure. It's not mm -hmm. a historic structure. Right. That's a significant structure in the district. Right. Thank you. Um, look, I think this is uh, important that there is a, uh, delivery workers and others that use uh, bikes or I'm just gonna start at the delivery workers. They're a critical part of our economy right now. And uh, they're workers who <laughs> they do a lot. And uh, I can appreciate the fact that uh, they have difficulty you know, getting around, they need gas stations. I sort of made that uh, analogy sort of to what the cab drivers have. It's a completely different thing, but they have a place to go for whatever, to check out their cars, to do whatever has to happen. And this is another form, this is another important form of transportation with an end goal. You know, it's delivery instead of of people, it's of goods to people. And people need to make a living. They need to make a safe living. And um, they need to be able to recharge batteries. They need to be able to rest. They need to be able to, you know, literally refuel in a way. I'm going to say that. So um, I think it's conceptually um, important. And I think that from what you've presented, this is a good seems like a good starting point to me. I mean, I, it's as I, you know, when I asked the question like that, or when we discussed it, I said, look, this is gonna, it's a one-off in a way, it's as you're gonna learn from this, even though you have another side of town that may actually become slightly different based on what happens here. My hope is that at some point there are, toilet facilities as attached to this because it would certainly make it much easier for um, the workers to do everything they need to do here um, and instead of having to run into find restaurants that might might in fact be closed <laughs> and um, I just think it would be at different at certain points of time would be easier for them so I can um, I can support this, and I would also say anything that uh, if any of the commissioners before me said that might need a little bit of attention uh, to work with staff, I would encourage that that happen. And I hope that we continue to be in a dialogue as you move forward. Thank you, Commissioner Chu. Yeah, I'm in agreement with my fellow commissioners. Commissioner Bland stated really well many points. I think it's important that we consider the needs and safety of our um, workers in the city. Um, I'm interested in this. I think it's something, as we've discussed, that will evolve. I can imagine future versions providing a little more shelter because that's one thing I think that it, that is needed, cover overhead. Um, but I think that this proposal is relatively uh, uh, discreet in its size, its location is something we're going to ask. I think that, as uh, Commissioner Black pointed out, I don't, I feel quite a bit as well. I don't see a lot of uh, people side of the street, at least not very quiet. Um, and I would say, or uh, looking at how this is working, the circulation is really what is going to generate what happens around and we're really curious to see. I can imagine it's going to foster a community. And, and communication amongst also the workers. So there's a lot of positive that can come from this. Uh, All right, Commissioner Master. 
Yeah, I, I actually think that this, um, this is important because it really reflects the changing needs of New Yorkers. You know, people don't really buy newspapers and magazines the way they used to, so the kiosk really wasn't being utilized. Um, and now we have something that's really um, a great need, uh, I think, in our, um, in our community. So um, I think that's very positive. Um, I also just wanna point out that this is also reversible. So I don't have a problem finding it appropriate. Um, I would suggest that you know you work out the fine points with staff, including the front. I don't know if that uh, screen on top is necessary for the roll-down gate or if it can be shrunk, but I would leave that, leave that up to uh, staff. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. I agree with uh, my fellow commissioners on this one. I think it's an urban necessity to have this and in multiple areas. My um, my only issue is that it, the form itself, uh, it should be it's a bit heavy. I think the location is perfect, perfect location, all the infrastructure is there, all of that. It should just be looked at a bit more for transparency and perhaps the hat is a little heavy. Um, and if they resolve that, I think we could, it would be a perfect uh, project to try out. Commissioner Goldblum. Thank you. Um, I, I agree wholeheartedly that the, that the program location size are appropriate. I, I share uh, some of Everardo's concerns about the aesthetics, um, and maybe to a greater degree. I, I think that it's, I think Fred's right. This is a piece of street furniture. And I think the, the, the and therefore, because of that uh, designation, it kind of uh, exempts itself in a certain way from uh, a particular need to respond to context or architectural style in a specific way, other than to uh, ally itself with the kind of self-effacing, uh, quiet background, clean and neat and tidy and no more kind of aesthetic that we've come to associate with street furniture, um, whether it's uh, a bus stop or a, uh, a Wi-Fi pillar or something like that, there's a kind of self-effacing is the only word I can come up with at this hour of the day, uh, quality that's kind of quiet, minimal and understated. Um, and I think that this is not that. I think this is trying very much to be Look at me with the neon, with the little LED strip around it and the kind of groovy shape and the rounded corners and the smoky glass. It's, it's not effacing itself. It's saying, come to me, it's beckoning. And that might be what they're going for aesthetically, but I think that it, it steps itself, it takes itself out of street furniture by doing so. And I think it needs to be quieter. Uh, and whether that's, looking carefully at the vocabulary of existing street furniture and seeking to emulate that or finding another vocabulary, uh, I can't say. Certainly Stevens and, and Everardo's comments regarding transparency would go a long way to that. I think we associate those things with transparency. Um, I also think that limiting the access to the front would go a long way to that. I look at the plan and it looks to me like you would be doing no harm to the program by having the access to, to the front alone. Um, uh, and that would eliminate the rather obtrusive and look at me stripes along the sides uh, that, you know, so if, if to the extent that that can be reduced, I would suggest that they consider that. But I, I personally think it's a bit loud aesthetically and without one scintilla of criticism for the functionality and the need and all that other stuff. Okay. All right. So thank you all for your thoughtful comments. And I think um, I understand all of your comments. I think we have enough to support it as is today with the uh, condition that they continue to explore the necessary height and trans and to explore the transparency with the staff. So would you be able to make that motion? Okay. And actually, let me just give you one of the typos uh, in the heading. So just. Thank you. Okay. 
with regards to LPC 24-06401 African Burial Ground and Common Historic District. A landscape park designed in 1870 and later altered by Robert Moses in 1935, application is to install a kiosk and bicycle rack. I know that this portion of Lower Manhattan within the historic district has undergone intense public use since the mid 17th century, resulting in the overlay of many significant historic improvements and resources, both above and below ground, all of which document the changing nature of the important area, area long devoted to communal public and civic purposes and that within the district, the African burial ground is historically significant in that it is one of the few preserved 18th century African burial grounds in the Americas, and that it reflects that New York City had one of the largest urban populations of Africans in the American colonies. I further note that the designation report also cites the significance of structural structures related to the civic uses of the commons and the location of the work within the boundaries of the common, but within an area that has been previously disturbed. I recommend approval with modifications, finding that the site was part of the commons, an area that evolved over time to be used for a variety of purposes, including as a transportation hub with diverse mix of associated structures. Therefore, the presence of this kiosk supporting public bicycle use is consistent with the development of this portion of the historic district. That the work will not eliminate or dan damage any significant historic architectural or archeological features of the historic district. That the kiosk will reuse the existing concrete slab and utility connection <laughs> from the modern newsstand to be replaced, avoiding potential disturbance to archeological resources, that the presence of the kiosk in this location will not disrupt any prominent views of significant historic buildings or features within the historic district, that the kiosk limited size, simple form, typical materials and neutral finish will give the structure a, sub a subordinate presence within the streetscape and historic district, that the predominance of glazing and perforation will help create a sense of openness and impermanence in keeping with the character of some of these structures, which were historically present at the commons and with temporary art and modern structures, such as a security booth and subway enclosures currently found within the city hall park and the surrounding streetscape. That the pr proposals Halo lit signage and border light will be restrained and well integrated into the overall design. That the striped ramp at the perimeter of the kiosk and painted markings at the roadway will be consistent with standard safety features of this type and will have a minor presence within the surrounding context. And that the bicycle racks will be simply designed and installed. A modern, great, well-scaled site, limited in number and typical in terms of material and finish. However, I find that the, that the portions of the roof screen overhanging the front of the kiosk is not well-scaled to the structure. Therefore, I recommend that working with staff, the front portion of the roof screen be reduced in height or replaced with the small screen in the future. Yeah, I think we want to just ask them as they're developing their component parts to explore uh, lowering the height of that if right. possible and uh, increasing transparency. Okay. Um, Vice Chair Bland, would you second that motion? Second. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Chu? Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? No. Nope. Commissioner Jefferson? Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Master. Aye. With eight in favor and one opposed, the motion passes. That's approved. Thank you. All right. That concludes our public hearing and public meeting for today. Thank you all who participated and thank you, commissioners, for your hard work and commitment as always.